it's it's it doesn't quite fit. Even sorry, I feel like I just heard the strangest noise I've ever heard. Um, it was like a was child a revving up. <laughs> a child. It was like someone up? screaming, but they were like revving the scream up. It was also quiet. I'm not gonna. Oh, it might it, it, it might have been. I was watching some. No, I'm continuing stuff to hear about it, the think... Jurassic World cats. Hang on, I think it's the raccoons. I'll be right back. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh yes, what? go see them. Go see them. We have raccoons. Uh, there are raccoons in the tree outside <laughs> of our skedaddle? apartment. Hi, everybody. <laughs> We're the skeleton crew. Um, we had an episode come out the week after uh, Midwest Gaming Classic, but this is the first episode we're recording after Midwest Gaming Classic. So a brief thank you to everybody who came by and talked to us and saw us during the event. I want to briefly highlight the piece of art that uh, one of our fans gave us. Thank you very much, Liam. It will, it will be behind me for a long time. I haven't hung it yet because I need to get a nail, but it's leaning on my couch in a very safe manner. So it will not come to harm. Um, but <laughs> mine's in my the, lab. The, Gorgos- the, the Gorgosaurus in will- your house, yeah, has the opportunity to do something very funny. <laughs> it would be very funny, uh, but I would be very upset because I love the piece. So thank you, uh, yes. thank you in particular to Liam for these wonderful pieces of art. Um, I really, really like mine. They slap. They're great. Yeah, they're great. And uh, you know, as the person who wasn't there, I feel that I should be the one to say thank you for everybody who came by to talk to us. <laughs> Um, but those of you who are at Midwest Gaming Classic, why don't you uh, why don't you thank them instead? <laughs> thank course, you, yeah. thank you, everybody. Thank you. That was, it, it was, was a good fun. time. Yeah, people were very interested, and everyone, most, just about everyone, was very polite, and it was nice to interact with folk. I think everybody also, was polite. We only had. The I one... said most. No, <laughs> you're right. One person was not. Um, yes, but they were not yep. a regular channel viewer. Were no, they, I, would you say they were built well for politeness? Ninety nine percent of the conversation was perfectly normal and polite, and then it very quickly was not. Hey, I, I would also argue that it wasn't normal or polite to say that we were the um, the Big Bang <laughs> Theory of paleontology, but it was fun. It was, Other, it was a lot of fun. and I met and shook hands with low tier internet celebrity Jack Packard, which was a huge deal for me. Uh, oh, yeah. I, just, that and I just want that to be on the record. It crushes me, but I did not see him. <laughs> he was super nice. Dalton got a glimpse of the nostalgia critic, like Bigfoot. On the this is true. <laughs> he is across my, the room. My bald <laughs> internet celebrity is better than you. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was that was the second morning, wasn't it? When we were all going into the con, like going. No, to the we door? saw a guy dressed as as him. Oh, <laughs> maybe it was no, the day it wasn't, but the day before I did see him, but he was not dressed in like classic nostalgia critic, uh, like black shirt, red tie. Attire. He was just mm. in normal clothing. Tr- he was traditional in, nostalgia critic. He was in clothes. civilian clothes instead of <laughs> his dress uniform. <laughs> I also, if we if we don't have to cut this, would like to extend a thank you to Miller High Life, the champagne of beers, because we would not have survived Saturday without. Oh, we really <laughs> wouldn't. Have. Yeah, it was like the elixir of life. Unbelievable! It was Not like sure. three p.m. We still had five hours to go. Yeah, I, I think we can keep this. I, no, it was. Yeah, no, it was great. Yeah. Let's see if we get a sponsorship from. Miller I would High like. Life. I would like to say. I would love if they're going to make changes <laughs> to the con for next year. It's unfair that you can only buy two Miller High Lifes on one credit card at a time. <laughs> because it's, I it's, had. It's not per credit card. It's per ID. Per ID. Yes, per ID. Because yeah. I would have bought more for my friends, but I could only buy two. And so others had to struggle on for another 15 minutes without the champagne of beers. <laughs> it, was, it was literally the water of life. I, I've, I've never had a beverage bring me back to life. Like when I, yeah. they first, life I was did. first offered the beer and I was like, I feel like garbage. I don't think a beer would help. And I shit you not, an hour later, we were completely different people. It was phenomenal. Anyway... <laughs> thank you to Miller High Life. Yes. <laughs> thank you to everybody involved with the uh, MGC. Yes, and, we had a fun uh, time. Yeah. Oh, also, like side note, to thank you, thank you to Dan Lucent, who is who we were working with at yeah. the City MGC. He's like one of the main organizers of the event. He was phenomenal. We've been working with him since August uh, to make this happen. Um, and thank you to everybody on the first night whose names I do not remember who helped us find a table and a spot because things were a little a little chaotic for a hot minute. 
Um, but mm-hmm. they, they, they made it, we made it happen. They made it happen. Um, so it thank, all worked you out. To, thank you to everybody, you know, who, who made it work and, and, oh, yeah. I had, I, uh, participated in and enjoyed a fish, a fish fry. You did. So viewers of earlier videos where I remarked with confusion at what a fish fry was. <laughs> now I know. And, and it's pretty good. And concern about cod in the Midwest. <laughs> yes. And it was fine. It was, it was, it was very tasty. It was the, oh. the whole thing with applesauce and potato pancakes. No, yeah, the applesauce and the potato pancakes really do, they elevate. Yeah. I'll also say a, a big thanks to uh, Bionicus, uh, one of our patrons. Bionicus. Bionicus? I thought it was. I thought it was. Of Maha <laughs> Nuh. <laughs> this is a genuine, actual, hold on, hold unfiltered on, on. Scott can't read moment. I thought it was supposed to be a play on. Dionicus. Everyone no, it's, in the it's comments. Dion, Dionysus. What's your favorite generation of Bionicle? <laughs> Thank Mine's you to the Dionysus <laughs> for uh, winning our charity silent auction for the holotype game, uh, where the proceeds are going to the Carthage Institute of Paleontology. Yes. Yes. No, I'd, I'd like to personally thank Carthage College also for requesting that we pay by physical check, which. Well, that's the Carthage College business office, which we do not <laughs> condone. That is why, no, we, we do. Dear that's viewers, why we're doing an we separate the Carthage Institute of Paleo from Carthage College very specifically. <laughs> separate uh, the art from yes. the and art. I would like I'd to also thank- like to thank our bank for uh, being an online-only bank that does issue physical checks. Otherwise, that was going to be a big problem for all of us. Oh, that's why we got the email about ordering checks. Oh, yeah. That's great. I had to order 100 of them, and I know we will use them precisely one time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but also, to side note to actual thank yous, um, thank you also to to Thomas Carr of the yes. Carson Institute of Paleo for loaning us most of our fossil replicas that we had on the table, which like they were a big hit, which were a big pit, a big hit, and people seemed to really enjoy. Um, and they really supplemented our own collection of five items, which was not, <laughs> which was mostly modern animals that I have on display around me as decor because. <laughs> You know, you're watching a paleontology YouTube channel. Like, what do you expect um, from home decor? And Dalton's Tiktolic. Yes. And Dalton's Tiktolic, yes. Bless the fish. Bless the fish. fish. The fish was it's a hit. coming and it's going. Bless the maker. Yes. Um, All right, I think, you want to talk about a weird bird? Yeah. Or do we have I think it's, more things I think to it's say? bird time. I think we thanked everybody. Yeah. Um. All right. Well, everyone who's on the internet that has told you that Quetzal... Quat, the, the animal we're talking about today, not to spoil its name, is is not a dinosaur and not a bird is wrong. We're here to tell you that scientifically, <laughs> all pterosaurs are birds and also so they're dinosaurs. <laughs> and I'm Dr. James Napoli. <laughs> I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences and North Carolina State University. <laughs> My name is Amelia Zitlow. I'm a PhD candidate at the American Museum of Natural History. My name is Scott Johnston. I'm the vertebrate paleontology fossil preparator and technician at Harvard University's Museum of Comparative Zoology. Mine. Amelia already went, right? I didn't hallucinate. Yeah, I, yep. No. Okay, cool. And Scott. <laughs> yeah, huh? My name is Alexander Rubenstahl. I'm a PhD candidate at Yale University, and that earlier thing I said was misinformation and not true. <laughs> Did you fall for it? No. Good. Let us know in the comments. Uh, my name is Dalton, and I'm here to say my last name is Meyer. Also today, um, I'm also a PhD <laughs> candidate. Did we Yale already do University. that? Gag? Probably. I don't know. I'm running out of brain. I think I did that one in the <laughs> Centaurosaurus video. Of brain. <laughs> um, but I'm I'm a PhD candidate at Yale University. Together, it's more important though that we are We're the skeleton crew. Skeleton, skeleton, skeleton crew. Yay! That was maybe our least synced up recently. <laughs> there All was, right, a, there well. was a pause there, like a advanced dark souls boss yeah um, speaking of dark souls when bosses they, when they have a pause yeah. before their attack so it becomes really hard to parry them ah uh, yes Fair. i hear there's a feathered serpent in a cage that you need to put into a bigger cage i do release yeah this this whole Ooh. the naming does go <laughs> harder now that you know we're pretty certain that all these things are feathery yeah especially yeah. this one's feathery too mm-hmm. yes which is one of it's one of the Few pterosaurs in the game. Oh, wow. Two pterosaurs so nice. in the game. A that comically small enclosure. Oh, oh it's this so is, cool, though. 
Don't God, worry, we'll this is like that. giving blackfish. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bluebird. <laughs> It's um, going to kill and eat its trainer. Okay, well. It would. This is an oh, animal yeah. that would kill it's and an eat evil its trainer creature. in a heartbeat. Yeah. This is Quetzalcoatlus. Giving huge Tillicum energy. Yes, yeah, I like Quetzalcoatlus. Hang on, I want to make a brief point, which is I like how the helicopter has to orbit this area to control the drone inside the dome to make it work. They don't drive the car up to do it. <laughs> the helicopter. You can tell that this really is a modern company because they have eight like useless positions because someone's kid needs a job. Well, they're like, we bought these drones. You got to use them, I guess. I mean, I would. (laughs) 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 The way it fell down. Oh, the the way it just. Okay. Um, Well, now we've we've freed the the one that's trapped. So let's go look at some, some better ones. I I would say, uh, I I think I would agree with, Oh, it's doing the thing. (laughs) Well, <laughs> that's really good. That's right. I like love it. that it sits like that, even though, like, God, it looks like I, me while I'm I do not think you could do that. You know, it looks like, and this is to tie into the naming thing, but when it's perched like that, it looks like the feathered serpent busts at the bottom, at the, like the edge yeah. of the stairs on the, uh, oh, which pyramid is that? Someone will remember. I don't um, know which pyramid. Um, uh, it's not of the sun, right? Is it? It's in, not- it's, 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 it's not. Quetzalcoatlus, it's Kul Kul Khan. Kul Kul Khan, and I think, oh god, it's the Mayan city. I don't know. Uh, my brain. Not Chichen Itza. Might be. It could be. I don't know. I'm I'm an ignoramus. I don't know nothing. I know one Mayan city. I said the, the other one is. Well, actually, I don't remember. I actually, might hold make on. I'll just Google the temple of Kul Kul Khan. Teotihuacan is the other one, but I don't know if that's Mayan. I'm not gonna weigh in because I don't know. Uh, no, I, El wait, Castillo. Wait. It's Chichen Itza, yeah. Okay. The Temple of Kul Kul Khan is a Mesoamerican step pyramid that dominates. Yeah, man, I saw that. That was cool. Oh, that does sound cool. I really want to go yeah. see those. They're um, pretty neat. But you know, speaking of the Mayan civilization and culture, uh, what does Quetzalcoatl mean? Well, Quetzalcoatl is actually, I think, the well, Aztec. It's Aztec. It is Aztec, yeah. I believe. Yeah. Idiot. Um, <laughs> So anyway, <laughs> sorry. Um, also, uh, I this is pr- I'm at some point in this video probably going to unintentionally try to pronounce the TL sound in the Aztec language, which is we'll, like the we'll do it now. It's like it's it's um it's a lateral alveolar um I think it's a voiceless lateral alveolar fricative, which is uh, essentially like the sound. It's only used in English in like one sound. It's when you say athlete. Oh. It's like the way that the air kind of moves around mm. the side of your tongue. Athlete. Athlete. Hmm. Athlete. Oh, yeah. Athlete. Athlete. Yeah. Ooh, that's fun. Athlete. It, it's also, I mean, it's it's used in Welsh a lot. The double L, which is famously in the town, the longest town name of all, in I think, in the world. Which is Clanfire Puff Gwingeth Golgera Quandroba Flantasilio Go Go Gok. Which is, um, which has, I think at one point, two double L's in a row. And that is the worst Thing as an English speaker to try to say that I've ever attempted. Well, I think did you made you have that in front of you, or did you remember that? No, James just what knows this. Think? It's one of his little talents. <laughs> it's one of his special <laughs> one of his things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I went through. I went through a period where I was very fascinated by Welsh history. So, sweet. Well, I'm enjoying that. Yeah. Oh. That's yeah. So it's it's pretty. found in a couple of languages, but it's one that's like it's kind of like. I don't think it's intentionally done in English, but it's functionally how a lot of people say the word athlete. athlete. Like, it, that's the closest thing to it. You basically make an L sound while you're allowing air to pass between your tongue and the sides of your mouth. Quetzalcoatl. Quetzalcoatl. That stupid. Like, it, I can't really do it. Quetzalcoatl. Uh, no. Well, the L is anyway, like pretty much unvoiced. that's what the name is. It means Quetzalcoatl. It means feathered serpent? Well, I mean, Quetzalcoatl doesn't translate to that, right? Like, I thought it was just the name of the... It's just the name of the deity. The name yeah. Of the... yeah. Wait, is, is Kukul Khan feathered, feathered I thought they snake were just the same or feathered thing. rattlesnake? Oh, no, Quetzal, Quetzalcoatl is the name and translates to feathered serpent. All right, oh. so... Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, Kukul Khan is Mayan and Quetzalcoatl is Aztec. Do the Incans have one? I feel like they gotta have a big feathered serpent, but... Maybe. Uh, I mean, they're pretty far south. Maybe different. 
the Keiche people have uh, Kukumats. Cool. These all have great names. They have, well, they, they, Wikipedia has Maya equivalent, Mixtec equivalent, and Inca equivalent. Cool. So, so a, a thing I knew, and hopefully this is still true and it's not a thing I was, it's not misinformation, is that like the, as we call like the cult of the, the serpent, uh, the feathered serpent and cult in like the context of how the Romans used it, mm-hmm. not, in that like there were these kind of, I don't want to say transient because some of them were very long lived, but, but kind of these religious sub communities that would be kind of come into popularity for, for a while at a time. But the one of the feathered serpent was super popular in Mesoamerica. And like one of the few ones that transcended a few different cultural identities and like existed in different uh, Mesoamerican cultures. That's cool. That is cool. That makes, I, I don't know enough about Mesoamerican history to know. If that that's makes true sense or not. because cool. as far as I know, um, and if you're an archaeologist who specializes in uh, South and Central American uh, history, then correct us. But uh, one of the things that I've always found kind of interesting about Quetzalcoatl is that a lot of the myths that involve Quetzalcoatl um, don't really talk about him that much or where he comes from. They all kind of, uh, the way I heard it phrased once, treat him like he's a celebrity cameo in other stories <laughs> that it's like, it's a, it's a story about these other gods. And then it's like, and then Quetzalcoatl shows up and there's like pause for cheering and stuff. Like when a Marvel superhero shows up unexpectedly, um, he's in the post credit scenes of every uh, Aztec <laughs> mythology. Yeah. But yeah. so it, it, at least as far as I know, like the origins are a little bit murky because it, um, it's, it's like a lot of the myths don't, like it's seemingly so well known that a lot of the myths don't really talk about like where he comes from or why he's there or what he's doing. That it's just like, oh, he showed up. And it's like, oh yeah, I get that. Well, I'll I'll also say that on the on the name, we can say that this that this critter is specifically Quetzalcoatlus Northropi. Yes. Or Northropi. Yes, the other one's yeah. about half the size, right? Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But is also well. We'll get into more, that more well known. But yeah, yeah, yeah. This one's Northropi, which is what I've always say, said. Um, but maybe there's an argument for Northropi. Uh, but named after the Northrop of Northrop Grumman, a company Indeed. we all love. <laughs> <laughs> yep. No, I love for... their products. Yeah, notably the B two Stealth Bomber. <laughs> I don't. I didn't know that when I said what I said. <laughs> <laughs> Did you actually not? No, I don't know. That. Well, oh, why would no. well, my, my Alex, encyclopedic knowledge of planes? N- no, your encyclopedic knowledge of um actualing everybody who talks about military industrial stuff. No, I didn't know that one. That's a new thing for me. <laughs> They're one of the biggest. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I'm I'm actually genuinely surprised you've never heard of Northrop Grumman. This is incredibly out of character for you, Alex. I think surprise. that they don't get the heat the, these days in the, in no. the circuit no, the way yeah, Raytheon they, does. I, yeah. They were the yeah. ones who said that they were going to build a, a train on the moon, if memory serves, recently. Well, wait a minute. Hold now, on. can they be all bad? <laughs> <laughs> it's no culture that produces trains can be all <laughs> Let alone on the moon. Train? Moon? Is it going to be shaped like a dinosaur? You've got like my three special interests right there. Oh, That's- God. I, James would have been... Italian fascist. <laughs> <laughs> he was born on time, you say. <laughs> you know, can really I make funny? them look like a dinosaur? <laughs> 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 this was this was a very f- here's a fun aside from my childhood. So we had some neighbors growing up um, where like, who had immigrated from Italy, and I was like twelve, and I was friends. I was friends with their daughter, so I was like hanging out after school one day. We were watching a movie or something like that, and the father comes in and he's just like asking me questions. He's like, "Ah, you're Italian," and I was like, "Yes." What gave it away? Um, <laughs> could it potentially be that my last name is the most populated city in Italy? Uh, and he was, <laughs> and, and so he was like, "When did your family come here?" And he's asking me all about my family and about my grandparents. And I said that my grandfather uh, was in World War II and he had served in Italy. And he just looks at me and like kind of lowers his glasses like this. And he's just like, your grandfather was a fascist. 
and, and then I was like, no, he was not. He was in the U.S. military stationed in Italy. I mean, I mean, well, right. hold on. He, might have been. <laughs> he was not. Um, it was very funny. Just the immediate. Just I have I met this child two minutes ago. Your grandfather. I, I'm going to psychologically destroy him. Your grandfather. He did war crimes. <laughs> This reminds me of the tweet you know- we were making fun of earlier today, related to 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 family and and World War II and timing. Where oh yeah, conclusions are are leapt to. And long story short, it makes me ha- I as far as I know, I'm grateful that both German lines of my family have been in Wisconsin since I think the 1800s. Good job. Same with mine, but not in New York, not uh, <laughs> not Wisconsin. Wisconsin, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, my my family came to this country. Um, I think in the in the teens, mostly early twenties, maybe one of them. But yeah, nineteen eighteen nineties and nineteen tens, sixteen twenty. Had one yeah, of them yeah, on the Mayflower. Yeah. I have no clue. Well, Ooh, that oh, does not bode not? well. Oh no! Yeah, <laughs> I may as well have fallen out of a coconut tree. You exist in the context. <laughs> Dalton, so Dalton was a was a immaculate conception. <laughs> Dal- Dalton said my activation phrase. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, well, we should talk about Quetzalcoatlus. Yes, yeah, well, it's a big, I, I, it's a big I bird. went down a, a fun little rabbit hole in regards to the the naming of this creature because apparently it was needlessly complicated. Um, so a little fun fact about cats here is that it was actually named and described in two separate papers. Why which you is, write one paper when you could write two? Which is very funny. Um, so the first one, uh, they were both by uh, Lawson. Um, uh, sorry, specifically, they were both by Douglas Lawson. Uh, who the second species of Quetzalcoatlus, the much smaller one, is named after Quetzalcoatlus lawsoni. Um, they were both in uh, the journal Science, and they were both published the same year, which was funny as well, because it makes it confusing to cite them. Uh, but... Like, I, I find it really funny that he just kind of casually names it in, like, one of the last paragraphs of the whole thing, where he just says, the Texas pterosaur here for, uh, hereafter to be referred to as Quetzalcoatlus northropi. It's just like, all right, just here it is. Did he um, name it for the airplane company? Yeah. Yes, he, he named it okay. for the founder of the airplane yeah. company. Okay, because also, it looks like an airplane. Uh, be, yes, actually, because <laughs> uh, because Northrop it, it specifically said that because Northrop was one of the first manufacturers of very large tailless airplanes, and mm-hmm. it's like it's a very large tailless pterosaur, and it's like that's I want, honestly kind of clever. What year was this? Seventy five. Okay, I and what I find. If, uh, sorry, continue. No, I'm going to I'm going to divert slightly so Okay. Uh what what I find also very funny given what we just talked about about Northrop is that uh two articles later in the paper where uh, uh <laughs> in the publication where he names Quetzalcoatlus is a paper on DOD sponsored research hmm. <laughs> which I just find <laughs> very very humorous. But go on, Amelia. You were going to dovetail onto something. I was just going to say, like, I never, growing up, because I was not a dino weenie, per se, uh, but I was interested hey. in prehistoric things. Um, uh, I I was very, very young. We went to, um, for those of you who don't know, my initial plan for my career was to be an airplane pilot, which means I've had an interest in airplanes for a long time. There is an airplane, like, and flight museum in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, which also hosts one of the largest air shows in the world every year in the summer. Um, if you like airplanes, if that's your vehicular v- fixation, like it is mine, um, highly recommend. Uh, but anyways, there's a flight museum. And I remember long, long time ago, like I can barely remember, there was like a special exhibit, like because one of the fun facts about Kets is that it's the size of a Cessna. Um, there was like an exhibit. I didn't do it, but it's like it was supposed to be like you were like flying with a Kets because it's a museum of flight, technically, mm. like. I, again, very vague, like I must have been like in the zone of, I was like in elementary school, like I was very, very young. Um, so I don't really remember it. And I don't remember 
whether or not I did it or not, but they had... I remember my grandpa telling me that they had, like, a flying cat's model or something. I don't know. It was crazy, but well, there was, like, a huge no, model. Yeah. One of these, and... Several of these models were made. I, I've always yeah. wanted to see one. Yeah. 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 So, there, briefly, that was... I remember, because there's... The Air Museum is on a big, a big north-south highway. My, I have family up north in Wisconsin, so like you pass the Air Museum every time you go. Um, you pass the, it's the Experimental Aircraft Association is who runs the whole shindig there. Um, you pass their museum, and they have a big billboard with whatever their special exhibit is. And for a while, there was it was a big cats, um, and I, I only very vaguely remember remember this, uh, but. That's really funny because of what I, the, the reason I made the mention of not being a weenie is that I had no idea what the species epithet was. I knew it was Quetzalcoatlus and that was it. Um, so the, the airplane connection escaped me because I probably did at that time know what Northrop Grumman was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a bunch of it's a bunch of it's... good names that a lot of Ashdarkids and the family Ashdarkidae in general is just real solid names. Um, yeah, real solid names for hollow animals. Yeah, hey, yo. hey. Uh, what hey, is this? That sounds like a dovetail to phylogenum. Oh, oh, do we want to do phylogenum first? <laughs> Never mind. Interrupted Scott. Well, hold on. Oh, sorry. Seemed like he had something he was excited to say. <laughs> I sorry. did. In the first paper uh, that I read about, uh, if memory serves, I think it is the first paper that um, Lawson wrote about cats. There was a uh, pterosaur from the latest Cretaceous of West Texas, discovery of the largest flying creature. Um, he makes a mention in there uh, to another incredibly named pterosaur that I was shocked I'd never heard of because it has a very good name, which is Titanopteryx. Hmm. That's um, great. Right? And so I valid. looked into it. I was like, what? And then it, it isn't valid anymore. Sad. Oh, God, um, because it's a wasp. Or a fly. No, it's a fly. It's oh. stupid. Well, oh, like it, it was preoccupied? Fly? Yeah, it, it, was, it was a preoccupied genus. I actually That's don't dumb. even know if it's a big fly. But um, so I was even more so uh, intrigued by its species epithet, which it has kept in its uh, new name. But he makes reference to that it's Titanopteryx philadelphiae from Jordan. And I was like, why'd you name it Philadelphia? So I looked into it. And apparently, um, it, so the, the genus is now named um, uh, Aramborgiania, which is a very good name to say. Uh, but it keeps the species epithet Philadelphia. Uh, and it's named after the city of, the, the capital city of Jordan, which nowadays is known as Amman. But historically was called Philadelphia. Hmm. Tight. And apparently also the people there were known as Ammonites, and that is not oh, yeah. the root word of Ammonites, the <sighs> sea creature. I looked into that. I was like, is this going to be a weird parallel thing? But no. So they were. Uh, I just <laughs> confirmed. The reason that it was called Philadelphia is, uh, as you may be able to guess if you're familiar with Hellenic history, it's uh, Alexander the Great's conquest, giving Greek names to everything throughout yep. Asia Minor. Right. Yeah. So it was renamed in the third century. Is it after BC. Delphi? Like lover of Delphi? No, Philadelphia or? just means brotherly love in Greek. Oh, okay. Like that's ah, literally an important Greek pastime. Well, it, it was it was it was named after the the <laughs> ruler of Egypt at the time, who was uh, uh, Ptolemy the Second Philadelphius. Hmm. Right. Brother, the brother lover. lover. Is was he one of the false Macedonian pharaohs? <laughs> Yes, he was a Ptolemy. <laughs> anyway, to circle back slightly, I unfortunately could not find a picture of the fly. Uh oh, uh, there, the Wikipedia a, page is pretty it, bad. Yeah, I was sad because there there is a fly that I think deserves that name. It's um, I don't remember if this is the right name for it or not, but it's what I remember. The name I remember is black horsefly. There, I, I sh you not an inch and a half, two inches long. Yeah, I, hate I don't much care for that. Those things oh, are I've, evil. I've encountered them back home, like rarely. And they are horrifying because they're so big and it's a horse fly, so they probably bite. I don't know. I they do. ran inside when I Terrible. saw them. They're, they're kind of incredible, though. I'll try to find a picture to, to show you because they're jet black. They're kind of, they're really beautiful. Um, yeah, I don't much care for that. 
No, I but don't like, much like them. care oh. for them. But they would they would deserve the name. Like I would. Here's my hot take about what the ICZN should do. I think if it's a bug, you can also name a vertebrate that. I yeah, they're too the same many. way where you can have I, plants and vertebrates with the same name. I'm torn on it a little bit. I get it, but also I don't know. They're also animals. I feel like separating it out, like because it's the international whatever on zoological nomenclature. Like it's zoology. It's still zoology, but. I don't know. Yeah, but on the other hand, there's so many good names for vertebrates that get taken because some guy in the Victorian England found a wasp with slightly bigger wings and was like, you know, yeah, Titanopteryx. I'm going to defend invertebrates for a hot minute. I think if you love what you're working on and you think of a cool name, you should deserve to give it, like, you can give it a cool name. I'm not saying that there's cool no, I'm not saying they don't so get many the cool names. Them to I know, right. but also... Like, you could probably mathematically determine that, like, X number of combinations of just letters... That are allowable under the ICZ. That's a big fly. Need to be it's reserved for. Um, need to be reserved for insects. Let me see the fly. You gotta see the fly. Oh, it's got like two compound eyes oh. that like meet each other. They're oh, so big. Yeah. I I would need it like to shoot that. Oh and, yeah, and no, no fly swatter, oh, just like oh, carry a hand. twenty-two. Let me. Yeah, look at that. I hate I'm, that. Let me find monstrous. The okay, I'm gonna, phylog- phylog- I'm gonna make a radical proposal that we talk about. <laughs> So this I'm huge sorry, fly. I just, no, I know we're at thirty-four no, it's cool. minutes. So I like, I I like a big that. fly. This is phylog- yeah. which we've transitioned to phylogenum. Look at that, Wahoo. folks. Wahoo, Dalton. Yeah, <sighs> what? I just you just just the wahoo put a different funny sound I wanted to make, but if I make it once, ooh ooh ooh. <laughs> Okay. okay, sorry. We're not. We I, we promise not to do that at random intervals during. The I rest make of those. The video. I promise. I, uh, I don't believe you. Quetzalcoatlus is a pterosaur. Now we actually have not done a pterosaur in a while, um, right? Yeah, it's no, been a, no, it's, it's been, a been since the feathered species pack where we did Good. the Holopterus. Then I'm going to briefly remind our audience what are pterosaurs. Well, pterosaurs are one of, really, there aren't a lot of major radiations of crown archosaurs that are not pseudosuchians or dinosaurs. They're really the only other one. Uh, So within archosaurs, they are one of the early branching groups on a line we called Ave Metatarsalians. Uh, And this means bird ankle, basically. They have a hinge ankle that goes like that, as opposed to crocodiles, which have a horrible ankle. A complex, what we'll call a croc normal, but really means a more complex ball and socket articulation. Yeah, it's like um, a peg on one bone goes into a socket on the other, and they kind well, of well, there are two. There's actually right. like there's a, a socket and peg on each one. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, it is cool. Um, yeah, pterosaurs f- fuse their ankle up, uh, so it's a hinge like a dinosaur and like a bird. This puts them in this group uh, for a long time. Their early Relationships were fairly uncertain. Now there's an emerging consensus that uh, Ligurpetids probably ref- are early close relatives of pterosaurs, um, which are kind of dinosaur-y looking. Uh, there's some adaptations in the skull. But as pterosaurs evolved, the initial crop of pterosaurs in the Triassic uh, into the early to middle Jurassic are these uh, s- relatively small-bodied. Some of them get a little big. Um with like maybe six foot wingspans, but you know, pointy heads, lots of teeth, long tail. Um, in the middle Jurassic, another, another group emerges. These are what are traditionally called pterodactyloids. Uh, they're transitional pterosaurs like Darwinopterids. But basically what the trend from that point on is short tail, long neck, big head, um, various losses of teeth throughout the group. And I guess... The, the the ones in the Jurassic are not large. It's actually pretty interesting that you don't really get really big pterosaurs until the Cretaceous, um, even though you do get pterodactyloids in the middle and early Jurassic. Um, they have hollow bones, tons of air sacs, like, um, like theropod dinosaurs and birds and sauropods, uh, which they may be inheriting a simple system early, but it's not becoming developed. It's It's developed independently of theropods and sauropods. Uh, they have filamentous integument feathers. We'll probably talk about that because this model has very nice filaments 
their feathers. Uh, Pycnofibers. This is a boo. This is an anti-pycnofiber environment on the skeleton crew. <laughs> anyway, um, within pterosaurs, now within pterodactyloids, at least in the context of this game, because the total relationships of the group uh, change a little bit and can be confusing. But we have things like pteranodon, which we've talked about, um, which are close, relatively closely related to things like uh, Maridactylus and Tropiognathus, which are a group that have teeth. Pteranodon lose their teeth. And then we have uh, Quetzalcoatlus, which is an Asdarkid, um, and more closely related to things like Tapijara. Uh, as far as pterosaurs in the game go, Tapijara and uh, Sungarpterus. It is a separate evolution of toothless pterosaur. They have these great long necks, long pointy face, some cranial ornamentation. Uh, and there's, there's actually a pretty good range of size of these things. They're not all giants. However, it does look like that uh, uh, Quetzalcoatlus's close relatives, um, things like Amber... The thing yeah. Scott said before. Uh, and also the... One from Hattag Island, which I can't believe I forgot its name. Hatsagopteryx. Hatsagopteryx. They got, I got there. Hattag Island. Um, yeah, they appear Ar- to be... It's Aramborgiania. Aramborgiania. Thank you, Scott. Uh, no they problem. appear to be probably form a loose clade of closely, re- generally closely related, gigantic, uh, spooky pterosaurs. That's phylogenum. Does anyone have anything else they'd like to add? I just want to, again, say that... Because all of these things have amazing names. I love that the the group Ashdarkaday. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, isn't it the Sanskrit word for dragons? I don't know. Uh, could be. It, it is a I'm dragon the... it is a dragon like creature. I think this is this is my Persian, very small soapbox. So I think um it it is Uh-oh. I think it might predate Farsi. Is is the okay. nerd going to complain about the the lumping of anything vaguely reptilian into the term dragon. Yes, because of the way it relates to conspiracy theories and cryptozoology, which I don't like. Which yeah, is like, sure. It's a very, yeah, yeah, well, I'm sorry, I'm doing it. Um, we t- we can talk about Northrop Grumman and, and their role in, in current geopolitical I, events for a couple minutes. I'm going to talk about this for one sec. Um, yeah, it's just, it's a very, it's like the Western concept of a dragon kind of gets like, plastered on top of a lot of like reptilian mythological creatures from various world yes. cultures. And so like we, there's a, a phrase I've heard a lot from people who are uh, in the process of going insane where they say, how could there be uh, dragons in all of these world cultures? If dragons were not real animals that once existed. Um, my mother actually told me that she used to go to school with a girl when she was in high school um, who was so obsessed with this conspiracy theory that she had, I guess, independently come up with <laughs> that she would go to classes early and start writing her like frantic ideas about why, where all the dragons had gone on the board before the teacher could get in, in like Ch- Charlie and it's always sunny Pepe Sylvia ways. It's I can't believe I'm currently looking at our Discord at someone who Making, just posted that meme. Oh yeah, <laughs> yes, <laughs> very funny. Yeah. Have it, these people it, considered that big reptile is cool? Well, no. Like think- what they what they have also uh, <laughs> what they also think is that apparently because the dragons breathe fire, their bones would have like dissolved or incinerated when they died, and that's why there's no fossil record of them. But there's no way to explain why yeah. everybody would have a, a myth about some sort of big reptile unless they were all seeing the same kind of animal. I just think it's a it's a it's a thing that I don't like because I think it also diminishes the you know our appreciation of the mythologies of other cultures around the world to kind of force everything into the box of, is that this is just a dragon? Yes, that's fair. Now, yeah. that being said, in this particular instance, Amelia has sent this image. I found it independently of art of Asdaha, the, the, the creature or, or, uh, uh, yeah, creature is what they're saying. So I don't know if it's a deity or not. And that's a dragon. Yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. Fine. This one, in this well. instance, that's definitely a dragon. It's this looks like an Asian lung. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, it yeah. makes sense if it's Middle Eastern. I mean, similar cultural ex- exchange and all that. Well, actually, the the Asian dragons are more spirits or deity figures than the. No, I'm, I'm not going to do that. No, don't um, do that. It's very cool art. That is, ra- it's yeah, rad. it's great. Yeah, it's on the computer, so you can probably show it. I had the dragonology books. Don't worry, everyone. I'm not being I'm not being a hater, but oh, yeah. I was. 
you know, at some point you're no longer 12 years old and you're like, God, it seems like, you know, the existence of cell phones would have solved a lot, really increased the rate <laughs> at which cryptids were described. <laughs> no, they live in out That's of focus me. areas. Yeah. Well, they're no, transdimensional. It, it, I like it, the transdimensional theory because no, it's, no, no, it's no, an it, excellent it, cop out. It, it, it's, <laughs> it's the Mitch, it's the Mitch Hedberg bit of what if Bigfoot is just blurry? Yeah. He just looks like that. What if his right. head just did that? His head just did that. Yeah, his head just did that. He just I, he, you phased, know what I really he was like? phase shifting out of reality. Talking There's that one like. Well, I do like no, that. But We're before get we there. get back Relax. to that, yeah, yeah. Hold hold your horses, Scott. There's this woman on TikTok, uh, who I've only seen things to other platforms because I refuse to download TikTok. But she's like inventing cryptozoology and folklore for the Appalachians. And it, oh yeah, it is so funny how everyone buys it. She'll just do a video and it'll be like, you know, if you, if you grow up in Appalachia, you know, if you hear your name spoken at midnight out the back door of your house, near your drinks fridge, you shouldn't go out there. And everybody's like, Oh my God, this is so deep. Which is, is such an interesting with the not deer, the not deer. Right. Which is yeah. not that sounds fun. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's f- like, they're like creepy pastas or SCP. Yeah, right. yeah, right. No, no, no. And I like them. I like them in that regard. Mm-hmm. What I don't like seeing is how gullible everybody is. That if you hear one person say it, you well, believe that it's deep folklore. And that's uh, that's right, the emerging peasant mindset of the American, where Americans and Europeans more broadly are becoming like uh, medieval peasants. Right. But I would, you know, yes, we should talk. Right. We should talk about quests. Yeah. This is big. But, uh, this is, you, you know what's really cool about cats? What? It's so big. It's, it's, it's so pretty big. big. It, it's, it's cool so that it's big. so big. I I'm so happy that people today get to experience life size models of it because mm-hmm. I okay. feel like it's a. Sorry, go ahead. I feel like it's a relatively recent development. Like even with like the the thing that I described at the EAA like years and years ago, I don't. There wasn't like a model at least in the museum. Like it was just, there was the virtual thing, whatever like flying model they made was not there or maybe it was, but it was high up. I don't remember. But like the field museum is the one that I remember being like the first like major institution that I was aware of, at least that I could travel to, to go see where there was like the, the it's blue rhino, right? The, I think so. Yeah. The studio. Yeah. The blue rhino cats are there and they've got the one flying, which is like, that's, I guess maybe that's the problem with the one at the EAA. I think there was one, but I think it was hanging from the ceiling and it's just harder to kind of conceptualize mm-hmm. how big it is versus like the one that is standing on the ground that you can go up to and be like, oh, it's the size of a giraffe. Oh my God. Or like I was telling these guys earlier, my first experience with the life-size cats was actually not the field museum, but it was at the Milwaukee County Zoo for their dinosaur summer, you know, uh, robot thing that all zoos t- tend to have at some point. Um, and the way they had it, it was like sitting on a nest. So it was like elevated by a couple feet off the ground. And, you know, you're at the zoo, so you'd already seen the giraffes, except in my case, probably not because at this zoo, if you turn that way, you beeline for the reptile house and the dinosaurs are over there. Anyways, it doesn't matter. The giraffes are there. We have giraffes. So you can see those and then you can go, you know, and see this thing. And I was with uh, my boyfriend, we turned the corner and I saw it and I just instinctively kind of hit him across the chest and kind of screamed a little bit because it was so much bigger than I ever could have like fathomed. Like if you haven't seen one of the life-size models, please try to make they a have, pilgrimage. They have one at the field that as you yeah. kind of come around, because there's one yep. flying and you're like, oh, wow, that's big. Yep. But then they have one sitting like a horrible monster and you're like, it's, ah, it's at nice. the entrance. Great of model. The- Scott, didn't your father um, buy a cat at some point? Yes, uh, this this is a fun story that I could tell. Um, so you wouldn't download a Quetzal You, you wouldn't, wouldn't download, but you could buy um, one for just Scott. Before we get into your cool story, I just wanted to ask Dalton something. Is Blue Rhino the company did that that did the Gastornis cast yeah. for the new Peabody? Okay, very cool models. Now to Scott. Okay, um, so a while ago, uh, well, I guess I get, my dad's former job he's retired now um was he was the director of facilities and operations for the college of literature science and the arts at the university of michigan and the last project that he did um before he retired was uh he was in charge of the construction uh and design of a lot of the new biological science building that they got and that's where the um, uh, that's where the Museum of Natural History is uh, now. Uh, so if you go visit the museum in Ann Arbor, uh, that building was in part uh, built by my dad. 
in the, in the broader sense. But like he he wasn't laying the bricks. But um, he was in a lot of meetings. But in one of those meetings, because it, it was kind of funny, at the end of uh, my time at Michigan, um, uh, my dad and I were actually actually ended up working in the same building where he was working on helping moves, uh, working on the like logistics. <laughs> this guy <laughs> is having a bad time. He's stuck. Okay, we'll get him out. Don't worry. Help. Um, where like my dad was in charge of a lot of the like broader scale operations of getting the building up and running. And I was helping move the collections and everything. So it was kind of funny. We would get lunch together all the time. But after one of the meetings, uh, my dad was chatting with me and said like, Hey, so like one of the things that we talked about today was in one of the two rotundas in the building, we have like the mastodons in there. We have the basilosaurus and the dorodon hanging from the ceiling and stuff. And it's a really, really cool display in this one hall, in this one rotunda, but we have nothing in the other one. And he was like, it's like roughly this big by this big. And we have a big space to fill in there. And he was like, we, we don't know what to put in there. And I was like, wait, how big is it? And he was like, oh, this by this. I was like, I bet you could fit one of those cats models in there. And he was like, oh, wait a minute. And then contacted Blue Rhino and was just like, hey, so how big are those? <laughs> and and uh, ended up uh, buying one of those flying cats models for Michigan. So Ooh, cool. I, that's how I very <laughs> indirectly funny. helped us get one of those in there. And it, it is honestly, it's a really, really fun uh flying cats model because even though it's exactly the same as all the other ones that you see there's a second level um walkway that goes right up to it so like you have both experiences of being on the ground looking up and seeing this over you and you can get right up just a couple feet away from the thing so it's the field it's a really, museum really does cool that model. too because cool. like you can walk under it in the great hall but the the kind of the Second floor mezzanine walkway around the Great Hall. Yeah, it's the same thing. Mm, it's a cool experience. I, I, I haven't been to the the uh, I haven't been to the field since they've had those. So they're very cool. But yes, if you can see a life size model of Quetzalcoatlus, I seek it out because it is impressively humongous. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. And and this is I think so. I I've got a story to tell about cats being really big. Um, so in college, we used to do in the geology department that I was a part of, we would do spring break, uh, field trips every spring break, as you may have guessed from the name. And when I was a freshman, this is actually the only one that I went on because I learned from this trip. I don't really enjoy recreational hiking very much, which was mostly because I was completely unequipped for it and had no idea what I was doing because I grew up on a flat piece of glacial till and had never uh, <laughs> gone on a hiking trip before. Fair. Um, I, I wound up also using the spring breaks to spend a little bit more time with my family. Um, but anyway, I went on this one. And what we would do is we'd go to a national park with a lot of significant geology. And every student would make a page of a field guide that they'd like thoroughly research the park and some aspect of the geology that was important. And you'd make a field guide page. And then during the trip, it was mostly like hiking and having fun. But anytime you got somewhere where it was good to talk about that stuff, you would like give a kind of impromptu little lecture about what you've learned and explain the stuff. That you did. Yeah, and that so, sounds like something Dalton did, right? Yeah, I did. A, our college did like the same thing. I did mine in Yellowstone. It was awesome. Yeah. It was, I mean, it's a great way to do geology and also make it like both fun and like kind of like it spaces out a lot of the science parts of it, but it helps you see a lot of the stuff. So when I was a freshman, this trip was Big Bend National Park. Mm. And uh, which is where the fossils of Quetzalcoatl have been found. Um, Big Bend National Park is, is an accurate name. It is both a bend in the Rio Grande and it's very big. Um, for context, it is larger than the state of Rhode Island. <laughs> which, Holy moly. It's, it's very big. And it's got... Um, Rhode Island is not that big. I don't no, know. It's still a state. Off. It's one Fairly. state park. It's like less than an hour to drive across the state. It's basically I'm... a European country. No, okay. like, that's a okay. good point. It, okay. takes, it takes zero hours to drive the wingspan of Quetzalcoatlus. This is an incredibly <laughs> small animal. Yeah, an yeah. Animal, this isn't even large land. compared to the state of Texas. 
I it's would exchange a saying. million Wisconsins for one Rhode Island. <laughs> just saying. Thank you, Alex. I'm, I'm, anyway, I'm, the, the, I'm intervening in this regional warfare that's developing here. <laughs> we're we're in the middle of Alex Garland's civil war, uh, where Texas is inexplicably well, fighting. No, because there's no pol- there's no ideology in that film. Well, well right. your your no one believes anything. There's just a there's just a fight. Right. So the um, Big Bend National Park has a lot of fossil-bearing geologic layers and two terrestrial Cretaceous deposits that I'm aware of. I think there might be others from earlier, but there's the Aguja Formation, which is, I, my understanding is like late Campanian to early... It's lower to middle Campanian, so it's actually like earlier Campanian. Um, and then the Javelina Formation, which is where uh, Quetzalcoatl is from. So I did my... Uh, Obviously, given who I am, I did my field guide page on the paleontology of Big Bend. And I included Mark Witten's illustration of Quetzalcoatl standing next to a giraffe. And so I remember very vividly, I said, okay, everybody like open your page in the field guide to the paleontology page that I wrote um, so we can talk about it. I remember everybody opening to that page and in unison, the entire group, like, group of my classmates saying, what the f***? <laughs> Correct. <laughs> when they saw Quetzalcoatl, it is really um, a gut reaction. Yeah, it, it yeah. is. It, it is such an animal that you can only the only response is this should not be real. No, yeah. like it I'm defies gonna... a lot of what we understand about how animals should mm-hmm. be built. It's really cool. It's, it's a cryptid. It's strange. It's a cryptid, and you know, it, but it. Oh, sorry, uh, Dalton. You can go ahead. Uh, well, I was going to say it just became a like kind of an inside joke for the rest of the trip. It really resonated with everybody. It was kind of all we talked about. And like, you know, people like, how could that fly? Are you sure they weren't flightless? They were warm blooded. What the hell? Why is it covered in feathers? All of that kind of thing. Um, And I will say it's perhaps the only time I've experienced in my life a piece of like a single piece of paleo art kind of having that much impact. I think like that piece, having it stand next to a giraffe kind of looking at it is like a stroke of genius. It is. Um, Oh, it's it's a nice, it's yeah, it's yeah everywhere and reasonably so yeah well, I mean, that's among my friends from college i'm sorry I mean, that's just the size but right. it's also like it has giraffe energy yeah. the way that the shape doesn't make sense like it's taller it's tall in ways that are dumb it serves giraffe it serves I, it but, and i think giraffe. it does a much better job at communicating the size than like the normal yes. silhouette next to a person yeah yeah like yeah. um, my girlfriend sent me today. She she was apparently not understanding the scale of the ship that hit the bridge in Baltimore until somebody put it next to the Starship Enterprise, which is about three quarters the size of the ship. <laughs> oh, she's got a, a great idea of she is she a big Trekkie? She knows like she, the scales a, of the She's a big Trekkie, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I was about to say I was like I can I cannot fathom the size of this actual container ship until you put it next to a fictional well, starship. Well I mean listen, I, like I don't have a great image in my head of how big like an F thirty five is or whatever they were putting next to it. Like I know they're big. I'm so sorry, but I I resisted the the urge, but earlier when you said, you know, it's hard to get the figure for uh, things scaled to like a normal human. And then you were like, anyway, my girlfriend <laughs> sent me this picture. And all I could think was, were you sending her pictures with you as scale? Because that's not normal human size. <laughs> it's huge. It, it's, the, it's the inverse of, Thank you. Uh, of Russell putting himself oh, yeah, next to the dunk. And yeah. everyone so was funny. like, it's wait so a small. minute, that human's huge. <laughs> that's such a power It's like move. a 2.1 meter tall human. What the hell? <laughs> right, Who is exactly. this? It's, it's like it's judge. It's he's using me. Judge Holden. <laughs> That's the scale bar. <laughs> oh, I, like like I just used me. I'm the scale bar. To um, diverge very quickly, I really like the colors of this one because it gives, it's like the Quetzal bird. Oh, yeah. Like that is. deep mm-hmm. green. Um, it's very nice. Oh, I yeah. think the, the existence of Quetzalcoatlus. Wait, like green? This is like a blue green. Yeah. yeah. It's like, I think it's more blue than green. Okay. No, We're not see, doing this again. again. Uh oh. No, the existence of Quetzalcoatlus <laughs> is. One notch in the in the God has a sense of humor column <laughs> in that everything is indeed bigger in Texas. <laughs> right. You want to share the other God has a sense of humor. Too. <laughs> that's that's your joke, Alex. <laughs> the the joke that Amelia's dad liked. He which brought was, up days later. <laughs> hey, that's the sound of a good joke. All right, I will very clearly for our audience articulate that I had just arrived at the fish fry. Um. And Which had, was, for context, a bar on a frontage road. 
Yeah, and it was about nine forty five PM. <laughs> it was nine forty five PM. And I had I had driven there from the Carnegie. So I I drove through Ohio and uh Indiana and Illinois. Uh, and I said, uh never let it be said that God doesn't have a sense of humor because your reward for driving through Ohio is to then drive through Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> and it killed That's a great joke. Having having done uh, the, the that drive in reverse recently, I just remember the only good thing is when you're driving east. Yes, you go through the terrible roads of Indiana, and then all of a sudden you're in Ohio, and the car stops vibrating like it's going to rock the screws out. The, out and there's the actually like trees. Like I don't. Yeah. To be oh clear, yeah. I don't condone Ohio, but at least visually it's more appealing than Indiana. There's some hills. No, it is. There are hills. There's trees. There's topography. It is an eastbound uh, salvation to cross New it Ohio. Is. It's like a burden is lifted off the soul. Whenever I have to drive through that area, I like to regale anybody in the car with me and say, you know that this was once the most valuable piece of real estate on the on the planet, right? <laughs> the America. French and the British went to war over it. America only existed because of free real estate. Right. It's free, free real estate. It's free real estate. Um, yeah. Anyway, where, where were we going with this? Uh, okay, we're we're talking talking about, that's a great question. question. Um, yeah, which yeah, is yeah, a big yeah. part of it. We have like, the cast of the humorous in our teaching collection, which is always really fun to pull out because it's just like this big. And you're like, oh, that's just one. That's that's not just one bone of the arm that makes up the huge wing. It's the smallest bone. Which, which and honestly, delta... oh, it, it hurts me because like that that's because Amelia's point earlier of like go see a model of cats because it's a religious experience um cuz like growing up our muse uh, the university of michigan museum um all we had originally was just a cast of the humerus mm. and it was like okay i guess it's big but like it's hard to envision a whole animal based on the smallest bone in its way <laughs> yeah it's so building off what dalton says uh so in the teaching collection, we have a like full pteranodon uh, wing, which is fun because we can lay it out across one of these long tables, and it's big, right? Yeah. Like it, gigantic. And then what you can do Pteranodon's is you can take the quetz, you can take the quetz humerus and just put it next to the pteranodon humerus, and like, okay, so it's that much bigger. <laughs> and it, it 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 always and it's got like it's not just that it's big; it's so weird looking. Yeah, because the delto pectoral crest on that thing looks like a soda. Like it, it's like after you've like pulled a soda tab, it's just jutting out. And that, I mean, I guess for the viewers, the delto pectoral crest is a process on the humerus, your upper arm bone. That is the insertion insertion for the major pectoral De deltoid and pectoralis major. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah, that one. Remember, yeah, if you're so, ever confused by an anatomical term, do honestly just try but, to break it up because anatomists are not creative at naming things. It's the muscle that goes to the chest. And the shoulder. One of the, and the shoulder, which is why they're for big flat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you also, just so you know, the deltopectoral crest is so broadly conserved in vertebrates that you also have one. If yes. you feel like, so your pectoralis major is coming up like this and your deltoid comes in here, it's like a ridge of bone. You can kind of feel it on the front of your humerus. Ours is mm. not as big as Quetzalcoatlus's because um, we dinosaurs don't fly. Dinosaurs also have big ones. Yeah, yeah. Dinosaurs in general have quite large ones. Um, crocs have pretty significant ones. Right? All birds, obviously. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's like those muscles are pretty major and I'm not aware of groups that have forelimbs that don't have big, like, where they're not important muscles, right. I should mm -hmm. say. Right. Sure. Um, so yeah. Anyway, I'm sorry. No, yeah. Uh, just, just that you know, it's a cool, it's a fun little uh, teaching opportunity too. Yeah. But you were saying something was... about how big its humerus was. I thought, or the deltopectoral. Oh crest. yeah, just just that. Like it, when when we do the teaching labs, we have the pteranodon, which is like big. And now it's cool because we could take people to the Peabody mm -hmm. and be like, "All right, that's that. See how big it is," and then we can take them back and be like, "Here's the." Quets. Just, just that it's big. That's all I want. Just, just, just it's that big. It was, we like to educate about how big it is. Yes, and uh, I think it's it's a cool prehistoric animal that resonates with people clearly. Like that's what I, you know, like my my friends in college, all of them are great. But as great as they are, they're not paleontologists, right? Um, they can't be perfect. They can't be perfect. 
Um, I would actually counter and yeah. argue that the percentage of your friends you have as a paleontologist that aren't paleontologists is a better <laughs> metric of how well adjusted you are. That's a fair point. Yeah. Um, but like, regardless, they they didn't really like they don't have a lot of skin in the game with paleo stuff. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. This is a thing that pretty much all of them remembered, bring up fondly, and like later that summer, a bunch of my closest friends from college came to New York for two days to do a full tour of the AMNH because the temporary pterosaur exhibit was out mm -hmm. there, or that was a big draw, and they had a life size mm -hmm. Quetzalcoatlus model flying. It's which it's, it, it's so cool. It's one of. It's it's kind of one of I think the new generation of paleo critter that's kind of entered the I wouldn't say widespread public but like the kind of like paleo curious public like people it, who, are, who it's percolating mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's kind of seeping in it's gotten it's in a new it's in the Jurassic World Dominion film it's entered kind of in mm -hmm. the public public conception and that's like because that. it's cool and big and people do like you know being the biggest of something is generally pretty cool. I know it's like, you know, easy to be like, oh, wow, you know, paleo oh, they've made a new paper about the biggest X. Yeah, but like, it's cool. If it's cool. The biggest X is cool. We we were just literally talking earlier in the video about the biggest fly. And I'm like, yeah, it's one of the coolest flies I've ever seen on principle of it being big. Right. It's also like, it's not just the biggest. It was so much bigger than anything known at the time. Oh, yeah. Right? yeah. Like, it's enormous. This is not and like marginally the biggest pterosaur. The way like people do a little bit with theropods, where like, well, which one's the biggest? And it's like I don't know, depending on matter. which of a billion assumptions you make, yeah. one of them's a little bit heavier than the other. It, it's like it defies understanding a little bit. I understand why so many people are adamant they had to be flightless. Yes, mm -hmm. right. Like I see it a lot. I saw a very frustrating Twitter thread recently with a bunch of blue checks all being like, yeah, the paleontologists don't understand what they're talking about. This has to be flightless. That couldn't fly. But like, it's cool. Yeah. Like I, I get, I get the gut reaction mm -hmm. on that, especially like, um, it is kind of funny that we'll probably dovetail after, uh, after that comment into what was it actually doing? And it does seem like it was a critter that was spending a lot of time on the ground, but it was definitely it flying. It's, what was it, that, Alex? How much does it weigh? It's like five. It's like that's a really good question. Yeah, there's there's a estimates. load of estimates on it, and one of the things that gets commented about cats specifically is that it's really, really hard to make mass estimates on it because it's so unlike literally anything that's alive today. The, there were mass estimates that were anywhere from like 90 pounds that seems to wrong. like to like over a thousand. That I think that I think that a lot of the more recent estimates have kind of narrowed down to genuinely about right in the middle of about so like four or five hundred four or five hundred pounds, which again, for a giraffe sized animal, it's is light. so low. Yeah. These things were ultra light aircraft. They so were, yeah. They were insanely lightweight for how big they are. We, if we know the femur circumference, we can probably get a pretty good estimate for the mass. And I was gonna ask if anybody, uh, do we have for Northrop I a femur? I think there's a referred uh, CF femur uh, for Northrop I. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, that would complicate it a lot. Because it looks like there's femora known for loss and I, or that are at least attributed to loss and I. Oh, yeah. Because loss and I is much better known, right? Despite being, it's the smaller one, but we have almost yeah. all of it. Yeah, we have like over 200 specimens of it. Most of them are from appropriately named a locality called Pterodactyl Ridge. Yes. Oh, what the? Oh. Ooh. Uh, Jurassic World Did Evolution crashed. Crash? Yeah. Oh. That's something that hasn't happened before. That's cool. Um, we're back, folks. We are. We're back. We've never, we're so back. Hooray. So uh, I'll say in our little technical difficulties there, uh, an adult male giraffe can weigh 2,600 pounds. So an Five animal times. is <laughs> roughly the same size as this. Just a little different. <laughs> weighing <laughs> that much less. Yeah, it's, it's almost the same. <laughs> That's fine. Well, it's like when I kept when I said that one time that the Tiktaalik model is just a little smaller than life size. It's yeah. it's much smaller than life size. Um, 
but oh, pardon me. Hmm. I the thought evaporated. It was like it just got <laughs> baked away. Um, what were okay. we? We were talking about how big it was. We were talking about. Um, I, I think we were going to dovetail into life. Life. Okay. Sure. Um. So. One of the reasons why I'm very sad that I've never seen one of the standing Kets models, which I need to go to the field and go see it, um, is because Ashdarkids broadly, but Quetzalcoatlus and the other giant Ashdarkids, like Hatsagopteryx and stuff, have been more recently hypothesized to be primarily terrestrial hunters or being more frequently terrestrial than a lot of pterosaurs. Uh, we have kind of a range on proposed terrestriality in pterosaurs. We have everything from Ashdarkids, which seem to have had a lot of adaptations to be quite comfortable being on the ground to things like nyctosaurs that lost their other fingers on their wing and were probably relatively awkward on the ground and probably spent most of their life on the wing. Um, it's actually one of the big criticisms that I've heard a lot of people say about the depiction of Quetzalcoatlus in this game is that it can't walk. Yeah. Um, it just, it, it'll land, it'll stand there, it'll drink, it'll eat, but whenever it has to move any distance, it flies. And we do not think that that is how Quetzalcoatlus would have done. Uh, if anything, it probably would have acted a whole lot more like we see in things like Prehistoric Planet, especially with the, how the Hatsagopteryx acts, where f flight is a useful tool to allow it to travel large distances and escape predators. Um, but when it was hunting, it was probably doing so on the ground or was like flying after things, grabbing them and then landing and feeding. Mm -hmm. So there is, well, so, oh, oh, so sorry. Go, go this is an issue with all, I mean, none of the pterosaur models walk, right? No, none of them. None do. of yeah. them do, but it, it's, it's more obvious for cats mm -hmm. that it's weird. I, I would say Kets and uh, it, it's kind of funny, bo both sides of the scale. Uh, Kets and Jehoopteris, like it, it, it's sad that they can't cr crawl around. Yeah, sure. It, I think I mean there's a number of things that to say about this design that don't work. That I do, and I think almost none of them are the fault of the actual design of the animal, and more the fault of trying to graft an animal of this size onto the like rigs and behaviors of the other pterosaurs in the game. Um, that that I think, you know, unjustly hurt this. They won't affect, spoiler how I rank it, but um, it is worth it to note that a lot of the wonkiness of the Kets is, I think, just a pure consequence of, like, hey, we had to put it on the pre-existing pterosaur rig, which is not well-suited for an animal that did what we think this does and is as big as it was. Um, but pursuant to the As Dark and Lifestyle thing, it's, it is, like, kind of become a meme that uh, these things are walking around eating baby dinosaurs, um, which I, I don't think for bad reason. I bet they did do that. Um, but something there's, that's interesting that came up when I was researching Quetzalcoatlus is related to the lifestyle of the smaller one, uh, Loss and I, which is that there's been... A, so for Quetzalcoatlus, there's been a lot of research and speculation on what it was... Do, like, what kind of lifestyle it led. Uh, when it was first found... You know, the, the idea was that, oh, maybe it was like a, a, a skim feeder eating fish, which is like a lot of pterosaurs had that idea. And that's been pretty um, resoundingly rebuked by the field now that we understand the actual adaptations that skim feeding birds have and the forces that would be involved of an animal this size trying to do the same thing, which would just break its neck. Um, there was a time when it was thought okay, it was probably a terrestrial scavenger, but it lacks, you know, a hooked beak. Um, or at least it probably does. Again, we don't have the, the head of... Northrop I, but we do have it for Lost and I, and there's no reason to suspect it was tremendously different. Um, and so then, you know, it's it's kind of gone back and forth, and finally we've arrived at this kind of, like, walking around and, and hunting terrestrial prey. Uh, but there are kind of two different environments in which uh, Quetzalcoatlus, both species, are found in the Javelina Formation. Uh, the Javelina Formation, shocker, everybody, represents uh, a floodplain. 
uh, a fluvial environment. Uh, what? A, a pretty tropical looking one, warm. Um, the paper that described the paleo environment was like, there's no, the only analog for it in North America is like the very Southern end of like Mexico and Central America. Uh, Cause it was just so warm and kind of a seasonal. Hmm. Um, and, and I've done my best to recreate it here, but there are, there are these two environments and you get more fluvial ones that so actual like river channel deposits. And that's where they find Quetzalcoatlus uh, northropi. That's where all of the big specimens come from or from those. And all of the little specimens seem to come from these uh, lakes that are uh, essentially bits of the, cha- the river channel that's been left behind. So like Oxbow lakes, channel lag lakes, those kinds of things, um, which are these really kind of shallow bodies of water that uh, they find tons of invertebrates in. And they're like really well bioturbated. So there's all kinds of like clams and, and stuff living in the soil of these lakes. And one thing that's been invoked for the small one, because they seem to be gathering in those locations so much, is maybe they're spending a lot of time probing into the soft sediment of the the lake and eating invertebrates that are buried there, which is something I totally like buy with their beak morphology that they could do. Um, and it's not something that you see like talked about for a lot of other Asdarkids because the like eating baby dinosaurs meme is so prevalent that... You know, they could have just been like eating buried stuff, like a lot of birds do. Um, like a lot of yeah, a lot birds. of shorebirds. While I agree that that's the most likely, I think it is also maybe worth bringing up that there are like pretty substantial demographic differences between what a dinosaur population would have been and what modern faunas look like. And I don't think the idea of baby special baby dinosaur specialists is unreasonable no. given that right because like dinosaurs are kind of like a secret third thing if you've learned like basic ecology you've learned about our strategists and k strategists right so an r strategist species is one that is maximizing reproductive rate and turnover commonly having a lot of babies that they are not really investing a lot in taking care of like coral or like i mean among vertebrate sea turtles Mm-hmm. Um, rabbits have been discussed as our strategists, like despite the fact that there's always parental care with mammals, like they reproduce really, really fast. And a classic K strategist is one that's at the opposite end where it is like really, really, really huge energy and effort goes into raising the young and protecting them. And the Humans. reproductive turnover is low. Yeah. Humans, Humans. Elephants. elephants, right? Dinosaurs kind of seem to have been a secret third category where they would have like... No dinosaur is giving live birth. We've talked about this for uh, in a couple of episodes, I think. It seems that they... Notably homalocephaly. <laughs> well, right. Notably yes. homalocephaly. Um, it seems that there's a physiological constraint that may prevent most archosaurs from at least easily acquiring live birth as a reproductive mm-hmm. strategy. And dinosaurs are laying small eggs. Like, the elephant bird eggs are way bigger than any non-avian dinosaur egg, right? Even large sauropods are hatching from eggs about this big. Um... So there seem to be like large clutches. Um, so they're raising a lot of young, but we also have pretty ample evidence that dinosaurs were taking care of their young a lot. What that may mean is that there was higher survivorship. And what it definitely means is that there were more baby dinosaurs relative to adult envir- dinosaurs in environment than there yes. generally are of large bodied mammals now. Like the image that you always see in documentaries and stuff, and I think Prehistoric Planet did a really good job of not showing this, is it's always like two parent dinosaurs and like three babies. When it was probably like, you know, they may have had clutches of 12, 24 young that were hatching at a time. That they seem to have been doing at least some effort with trying to get to adulthood. Like, we don't, we can't really know when they would have left their parents' care and it would have varied between species. But like, Mm -hmm. there's clearly quite a bit of uh, parental investment in the survival. Right. (laughs) And sauropods may not have done any. Mm -hmm. Um, Right. They may have been much more traditional R strategists, but like theropods seem to have taken care of their young. Right. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, at least a bit. sit on the eggs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, uh, it's not bad. And like, listen, alligators also take care of their young. It's not really... All archosaurs that we know of yeah. take care of their young. Well, right, right. Um, it, it seems to be a general archosaur feature. Um, but anyway, I, yeah, I just... Reflected, you know, in, I think, in alligator populations, so that there's a lot of, like, juvenile and... Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right, there's always a lot of, like, relatively immature ones yes. around... Um, but there are also often many uh, closely related species of crocodilian juveniles coexisting in the same habitat. That's interesting. Um, that doesn't have implications for anything. <laughs> I'm sure it doesn't. Sure doesn't. Um, 
but, but yes, but yeah, it, it is a, uh, it is an interesting idea that I've heard floated and I've thought about a little myself is like, is it possible that some clades or species are adapting specifically to prey upon like only young juveniles, given that there would have been so many available in the population? Or possible. even n- not necessarily just like specifically young juveniles, but small dinosaurs. Well, I'm, I'm, I mean, yes, but in this case, I'm talking about juveniles specifically because like, like you, like, with mammals, right? Like a, a, a cat couldn't specialize in hunting only juvenile antelope because the reproductive output is nowhere near high enough. No, to yes. It, I, right? I, I guess the, the point I'm trying to say is that like if if you're eating juvenile tyrannosaurus, you would probably also eat an adult Thescalosaurus because they're not that big. Right. And I, I mean, hmm. yes. And I don't – I. Yes. The idea, the, the the thing I'm talking about is much more of a hypothetical than anything. Like, I, I think these animals probably were not discriminating very much what they ate. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Got yeah. it. I, I thought yeah. you were proposing that these were genuinely juvenile specialists. No. What I'm trying to say is I think the idea that there would have been genu- genuine juvenile specialists is not dumb no. in, dinosaur, in dinosaur populations because it would have been much more ecologically viable than it is for any group mm. now. Well, what... What is a ju- like? I guess what I'm having trouble with is like, what is distinguishing a juvenile specialist from like just a small or like mid-sized faunal specialist, right? If it's like preying on things that like exist in a like particular size range, isn't that because like I get like an egg specialist, you need to have a specialized anatomy to like eat eggs, or like even yeah. like 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 mound raiders or stuff like that, versus like. If you're just like happen to be eating, like Scott said, things that are the cellosaur size, and it just so happens like six or seven species of dinosaur pass through that size at some point and are there for a little while that you're like, oh, I can also eat these. Uh, well, I mean, I, it would be behavioral. And this is the kind of thing we couldn't know in the fossil record, right? Like in, in the modern day, there are a lot of cases where there are things that have no obvious morphological signal for this that just for whatever reason specialize on particular prey sources, mm-hmm. right? Like... Mm-hmm. They they could eat more than they do, right? Like black footed ferrets are like incredibly specialized on just prairie dogs. Yeah, there's no real reason sure. that they have to be right. They that's just that's what the species does, and so you could imagine or a snake that only eats centipedes. <laughs> yeah, there are, there are snakes <laughs> that only eat centipedes. Right, right. Um, I mean, there's not really long, any long reason violent. that violent. There's no reason that pandas need to only eat bamboo. Like they could eat other plants. Don't they just tell don't. Them. Well, yeah, well, <laughs> like, don't make him feel bad. I'm not changing for anyone. Yeah, I will eat bamboo. Uh, it has no nutritional value whatsoever. <laughs> My parents so- ate bamboo. Their parents ate bamboo. And God, <laughs> the children I refuse to have will also eat bamboo. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, real and- quickly, while, while we're talking about the, the predatory strategies of these guys, can I make a proposal? Yeah. yeah. Can we release some small dinos into here? Because Ketz has some phenomenal hunting animations against I some smaller dinos. was going to ask if we could kill some homalocephalae. Yeah, what's, uh, what's in not the Not homalocephalae one? specifically. No, I, would I know. Say, it's just... What will they eat? I don't know. So, Stingy? they'll eat two things... One, both of them are amazing. One of them is way more ridiculous than the other. So I would propose that we release some Struthiomimus because their Struthiomimus kill animation okay. is phenomenal. And then, why don't you throw in some Centaurosaurus? Because they'll kill a Hadrosaur. Will they really? Fascinating. They will. Okay. It is have... a bonkers animation. Do they fight the T-Rex? They do not. Ah, so a more realistic depiction than priest. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they'll kill, they'll kill Struthiomimus. They'll uh, well, they'll kill the Ornithomimosaurus. They'll, uh, which also includes Dryosaurus because mm-hmm. of just rigging. Um, they'll include, they'll kill Hadrosaurs, and I, th- and they'll kill the goat and people. Okay. Um, oh, baby. But because I, I, I find it funny because we mentioned that like all of these proposed hunting strategies for cats. There was actually in uh, Lawson's paper on this. He There's a very funny sentence that is incredibly run on, but made me chuckle when I read it, where he says, um, 
the lack of perennial lake deposits, the small size and braided nature of the streams, the large size of the pterosaurs, the structure of of their cervicals, and their close association with sauropod remains argue against a primarily piscivorous habit Mm -hmm. and may have indicate a carrion feeding mode of life. I could take issue with almost every one of those actual individual points, but I do think that this is a case of he did the wrong math, but he got the right answer. Yeah. Well, yeah. I I don't... I don't... I can't imagine they were only carrion feeders. Very exactly. few things are. Yeah. Very few things are. And uh, it's, 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 just, it's just condors and T-Rex. <laughs> it's just... Weird. Yep. It's just condors, vultures, and T-Rex. It's Maybe they're very strange. Fish or, oh, no, I wait. Was it, wasn't there that other thing a while ago Clam. that... Um, uh, referred to Allosaurus as an apex scavenger. Oh, one of the... Uh, uh, I, I actually, I'm not going to speak on that because it would uh, solely my... I, I, You know, if you can't see anything nice, don't see anything at all. That's fair. I <laughs> don't have to... I don't follow that rule. <laughs> yeah. uh, Alex, we know. Alex says, if you can't say anything positive, don't say it. <laughs> it just... Um, yeah, no, I remember what you're talking about, Scott. Oh, oh here we go. All right, oh. this is... This animation is... Insane. Oh, please Flea. don't do it in the trees. Oh no, <gasps> here we go. Oh, whoa, that's, that's awesome. Sweet. Oh. <laughs> rum, I rum. love that. So if you watch and listen to the sound effects, what it does is it swoops down, it picks it up by the head, and then what kills it is it landing and breaking the oh. neck with the inertia of the body. That's <sighs> like That's whipping down. It could definitely swallow that. Str- I'm kind of mad it can't swallow that struthiomimus whole. I would have loved to see its horrible ha- head go like. Oh. It, it does that to the goats. Oh, that's Excellent. Cool. Which Pleasing. honestly, I, I will say, it's another like sad missed opportunity. I wish that this was the only pterosaur that actually required a goat feeder. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Because it looks it, it looks extra wrong feeding from the fish feeder. I mean, like the animations look mm-hmm. nice. But, like, knowing what we know about this animal and knowing that it has a lovely goat kill animation, the goat kill one, it's, it's very funny. It's the same one that they do with Hamalocephale. It just lands on it. It literally just steps on it and then just picks it up <laughs> off the ground under its foot and swallows it whole. I, uh, it's very yeah. good. I I can soothe myself. I can um, pretend that when they're eating from the fish feeder, they're probing for invertebrates in the in the water bottom. Or just now, a slow fish. Have we? Oops. I'm sorry if my sinus headache has prevented me from recognizing this, but if we discuss the fact that the like separation where they're found may also be a function of the conditions in which these things would preserve. The like, we have not. One could say. No, we have not. Well, like the smaller one is found in lakes, which tend to be much calmer and have less water movement, so their delicate bones would be less likely to be destroyed. What? Yeah, no, that's not the most what? surprising thing. It's. Yeah. I mean, a bit more you, that, like, if you, you would expect if the big ones were around there, you might also find them, but... Well, right, right, right. No, I mean, unless the big ones were just that much less abundant. Yeah. But, like, yeah, no, that's I mean, good. that's a fair point. It's almost... I have, I have a hot take here at the Skeleton Crew. You? I have a dissenting opinion that no one else in the crew believes, <laughs> which is that uh, before any interpretations of paleoecology are made... You first have to do taphonomy and a little bit of geology <laughs> and think for maybe three seconds. And then you can do math or like, I don't know, make up ecology or whatever. This is a joke. We all believe this. Yes. Well, yeah, it is. It is important to keep in mind that the depositional conditions will control most of what you find. Yeah. Th- not just keep in mind. That is the it, first thing that you have to think about. It, it is always what you have to think about. Then the other stuff. Right. Once you're like, okay, well... You know, but there, but I will, I will echo Dalton. It is interesting that with the with as many of the large ones as we found, it is interesting that they've never showed up in those environments because they certainly would sure. also could be real there. Yeah, especially because we have so many loss and I. Like if it was just like we found five of them and they were in a lake, it's like all right. But like two hundred, again, they're not two hundred entire full animals, but right. there's a yes. lot of material. Um, yeah. 
two hundred. Sure, that's a lot for like any terrorist. Paleontologically <laughs> speaking, you don't need to um actually all that. I don't, I don't know, right? He like, can though. But like five versus two hundred as as like is a, like a measurement error in like a population of storks or something. You're a paleontologist. Yeah, where did where did this mindset all of a sudden come from? Eurypterids. Yeah, nobody. Yeah, it, this came from he's publishing a Eurypterid paper. There, that's where it came from. There, there's a single slab that's as tall as me of Eurypterid fossils that has more of like one species than all Quetzalcoatlus fossils preserved. That's true, but it's, I'm just it's very when most as dark as are known from like two bones. Well, no, yeah, comparatively sure, but I mean, just like comparatively, two hundreds a lot though. Like, listen. I say this as maybe as maybe the currently vocalist voice about this. The vocalist voice. The vocalist voice. Um, nobody ever actually looks at that many of modern animals either, though. Like no. every that's every fair. study is like, oh, what does alligator have? I'll look at one, and then that's what alligator looks like. Um, you know what I mean? Like. It, it, Alex, when you're scoring a I'm crocodilian not, sorry, matrix, I'm not sure I follow. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, do you how many alligator Mississippiensis specimens of the thousands available to you do you look at when you score alligator Mississippiensis? One, one, right? So, like, having two hundred is still more information than most people use. Well, yeah, but people are still only scoring one. Of those. Well, well, right. No, I mean, <laughs> it's a problem. Listen, watch the space. The skeleton crew is going to talk a lot Observe. about specific variation at some point in the future, and it's an important thing to know about. Yeah, um, I don't mean to poo-poo what could be an interesting actual signal. I'm just, yeah. you know. Well, I mean, I would also be curious to know, are other things found in those lake deposits, or is it, like, monospecific? Um, like, other than... Even well, let me pull up. I, I have the um, the kind of paper that discusses this, because it was all part of the... Um, there was, in 2021, a uh, memoir it's of the... Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology that had like five papers on Quetzalcoatlus in it. That was, you know, it was it was like, hey, we're actually finally describing Quetzalcoatlus properly. We're solidifying the name because there were some issues and it might have been a nomen dubium. We're naming the new species that everyone's known about for a long time. Okay. There's the other uh, pterosaur from the Havilene Formation that we're, we're naming. There was a, a debacle around that. And then there's also yes. a paper on like, here is like biomechanics of Quetzalcoatlus and here is the habitat of Quetzalcoatlus. So it's quite a, a treatise on this. It's very uh, impressive. <laughs> there's, there's nothing in the lakes besides these quests. It's a boom bust ecosystem. <laughs> is... They eat everything, die. <laughs> um, <laughs> they're locusts. So, so in the abstract, it discusses that the shallow lakes were inhabited by a diverse invertebrate fauna of arthropods, gastropods, and bivalves. Um, Delicious. There are. There's there's ichnofauna in there. I don't know if there are other vertebrates besides Quetzalcoatlus. I don't know if there are fish. Um, that's it, it but there are invertebrates. Like yes, mm. they, he said that there are invertebrates. So, yeah. yeah, they could be eating lobster. Sorry, I just had an image of a Quetzalcoatlus with a monocle and big top hat <laughs> eating a lobster, <laughs> like the enjoying a lobster. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> enjoying a spot of lobster. But no, they, they say like a likely food source for these uh, for the smaller species of Quetzalcoatlus is all these invertebrates in these lakes where they're they're commonly being found. And I don't doubt hmm. that at all. No. no yeah. Everybody likes a good sea bug. Me and included. honestly, I, I I think that that's because I, I I just had the thought of like oh it, it, that's funny because they they don't seem to have any durophagous like adaptations. I was like oh they're just big enough that just they swallow, can swallow yeah. them whole. Gold. Yeah, I'm like oh never mind. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I mean they don't could... need to crush the shell. Just let the acid do it. I would really like one of these to kill a hadrosaur. Um, I want to. I think I need to take this moment now to talk about the introduction of Quetzalcoatlus in Jurassic World Evolution, or I'm sorry, Jurassic World Dominion, mm. which has, um, I think, a, a tie. I don't know what's worse, the line writing or the line reading for the phrase, uh, you know, when they hear the sound it makes, which is a good sound. It's not the Quetzalcoatlus we all know and love on the skeleton crew, but they give it a good sound effect. I think the design for the movie is great. Yeah. You know, oh, the viewer so probably notices we haven't really talked about the design right now, and that's because I, I think of all the things in, that were introduced in Dominion, this is probably the best except... I mean, I love the Moros design. It's not incredibly mm. truthful to what Moros would have been because it's too small, but it's a great design. We'll talk about that when we do Moros. Um, but the Kets design's great. 
and then of course they have to do the they have to do the movie thing where they say what was that (laughs) and then the cool pilot says quetzalcoatlus late cretaceous should have stayed there (laughs) And I'm like, did you even know, did you like parse what the re- meaning of the, nobody who ever speaks this language, it, like not, na- like not the- even natively, <laughs> anybody who learns to speak English would know that's not how you inflect or intone that line. It's it's like the phonetic line readings of the extras in Temple of Doom. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's it, it, it's it, like it, it, you're working so hard to sound breathy cool. and cool. Like you're not even speaking it in, sucks in normal because- English. It sucks because that, like the sh- the way that that scene is shot, is really cool. Yeah, when it's just like they're flying this big plane, and then just a shadow goes over the entire plane. Oh, it's and great! It's just, oh, <laughs> and then and, and then, then it takes the whole thing down and stuff. It's it's pretty rad. I but you know I couldn't even get back into it because I, I was literally just so distracted by the line reading. I was like I was. I was just on a different plane for a little while. It was, I think, the second line in the movie I laughed at audibly. The first one being, is that Dreadnoughtus from, like, a thousand miles away? It's just big enough. Yeah. It also, like, I'm actually, I'm re-watching the scene right now. Uh, I, I forgot that it it it's, it acts so dumb because it, it's like they're flying and you see it, like, literally cast a shadow of the whole thing. You look up and you can see the wing membrane through the cockpit and then it disappears and then it shows up from the back and destroys the plane again. Right. And it, or not again, but it's just, it's back now and it's like, it makes no sense just from how you would shoot that? Oh, it's Thinking really dumb. In like the context of the universe, right? Of the of the JP universe. Like right, most dinosaurs oh no, dinosaurs are now part of your wider world. And I think for the most case it wouldn't be like an issue. Like it's like uh, you know, different strange or large animals. But I really do think Quetzalcoatlus would be like one of the exceptions. Like the Mosasaurus would be an issue. <laughs> yeah. And the yeah. Quetzalcoatlus <laughs> Would be an issue. Like it could it kill would, you. Like planes would crash. It's no. It's the biggest danger is like one of them flying into a liner yeah. jet. <laughs> it's a lie, lie, lie. Let's take a question. Why? Why? I like Especially- that it lands on top of the plane and stabs through it, and just its its beak is like the sharpest, strongest thing in the yeah. world. It can rip right through steel. It yeah, it makes no sense, but wow, that's a cool shot. But it also would like decapitate itself <laughs> trying to yeah. do that. But but also like these things of all of the critters that were like again in the broader like world now, oh my god, these things would definitely be the ones eating the most humans. We are a very good prey size for cats. Like, I could definitely see like if they in the next Jurassic World one, if they did want to go in the direction of, like, oh, it's a continuation from the previous ones, and uh, just like having a, the di- the dinosaurs out in the real world and stuff off the island, you, then having. Sorry, I was going to build yes, off Alex. of yours with the shot idea, but I'll let you finish. Um, no, go with your shot idea. Just like a, just like a, a, a small, like a low angle, like a, a low shot of like a little girl building a sandcastle on like a beach, and like. The, uh, the coast of California, and just kind of like you hear a thump, and you like pan slowly away, and you can just see these horrible stories, just weird arms, and then just the legs of someone dangling behind her, and they get flipped up. <laughs> they just stop on a beach every so often to eat someone's family. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. That was yeah. in my mind. You know, I think if this happened in the real world, though. I think it's actually kind of a fun coincidence because if Quetzalcoatl were around, I actually think Northrop Grumman would be very <laughs> effective at handling the problem. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. But yeah, please. I know that Lockheed made the A-10, but the, I think I, I don't think it would be that big of a problem if there were dinosaurs in the real world. It's just, <laughs> I think, I think it would be a problem for about five hours. A problem for the dinosaurs. <laughs> I want, I want to live in that universe because I want to see like the after the fact like zero dark 30 esque movies that are about condemning slash celebrating the, the US military's instant eradication of the dinosaurs for the second time on earth. Well, no, the, the only reason that oh. 
the like quest Adam would be in 65. <laughs> oh god right <laughs> yeah they put a grenade in his mouth well the quests wouldn't yeah. be the quests would stay a risk because they just send F35s after them and they'd fall out of the sky or decapitate their pilots <laughs> right they're, they're all coming <laughs> cut in half clean down the middle <laughs> Uh, Dalton, want to speed this up a little Ugh, bit to see if we I'm can sorry. get a hadrosaur sure. here? Because I would, I would love yeah. to see. While it. we're, um, I mean, oh, <laughs> oh god, it looks so funny. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like, I mean, I, th- I feel like I've made this comparison before. When you take a pencil and you, oh, do the, yeah. you wobble. <laughs> <laughs> Look, rubber. I love my magic rubber trick. cats. Um, do we want to talk at all about the design while we're waiting for this hunt to happen? Yes. Um, I'll say that this is one of the rare um, movie critters that uh, or or one of the rare like recent movie critters where I simultaneously both love the movie design and the frontier design. Mm -hmm. Um, I I generally prefer the frontier design because I like the patterns on the wings and I like the even brighter color on the face and crest. But like that movie design is such a banger. The kind of pale yellow beak and the bright blue head crest uh, is peak. It's it's so pretty. Uh, and then some of the um, game, de- uh, some of the frontier designs where it has like an almost butterfly wing mm-hmm. pattern on the yeah, like that one there. That's man, that looks so funny. Uh, hey Dalton, why don't you delete some of the fish feeders? Sure, make them hungry. <laughs> Jesus, make them work for it. I'll delete all of the fish feeders. Work for it, darling. Like yeah. I, I think that th- this is a f- it's a phenomenal design, and I'll actually say that um, the other introduction to cats in the movie, which is the. Um, the one in the, I forgot what it's called. The bit the in flashback the flashback scene. The, the bit in the oh, Cretaceous. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, that introduction I think is phenomenal because they pan over a, the a lake with all of these pteranodon on it, and you're like, oh man, pteranodon, that's a pretty big one. And you see this thing coming in from the distance, and they have it coming from so far away that it just keeps getting bigger, <laughs> and, bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until it's taking up almost the entire frame as it lands and starts picking on some of the pteranodon. It's pretty great. Don't know uh, the person they the really. Oh, it, 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 it does, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me. I forgive you. I do not. But my Tommy gun don't. <laughs> what? In the in I... Home Alone, uh, the the movie, oh, the movie yeah. within a movie, Angels with I found filthy out souls. Angels with filthy souls, which is <laughs> maybe such a two good years name. ago that that was not <laughs> real. <laughs> I know. They apparently like the guy in it was like an old old actor who lived in the Chicago area. Like, oh, here we go. Here we go. Oh. oh. It's happening. It's happening. It's happening. Oh my god. Oh, <laughs> oh god. That's I feel bad phenomenal. for this dinosaur. I love that it after it takes it down by by the head, it stabs yeah. into the body and then twists. If you notice, it's a little quick stab and just like 20 degree twist. It's great. Wow. That's I, awesome. Yeah. This, this so I'll just comment briefly. I love the design. Um, oh, here we go again. Do it in slow motion, Dalton. Do it in slow motion. You can yeah. do that. Hang on, let me make it get to it. All right. Once you see him lock in. Target acquired. <laughs> oh, dear God. Oh, this is hell. And on the highway to the danger zone. Oof. It like stabs oh, it in the heart. That's amazing. <laughs> it's so hardcore. Precision aim. The the other phenomenal animation with this critter that I love so much is how it'll kill and eat the gunner on the helicopter. Oh, that's cool. Because one of the best things with that as well 
is remember, you can be first person as the gunner on the helicopter, and it'll do it first person. Oh, that's cool. That it'll, like, slam onto the, the landing ski, and you'll just see its its head just goes back and straight forward, and then it just rips you into a third person <laughs> perspective of the helicopter as it, like, cartwheels off the back and flies away. It's awful. I love it so much. I, it's an awful I, animal. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, they're just demonic. Yeah. I, edged Arcades are some of the coolest things for any sort of, like, fiction, movie, paleo media. I think it's great. I think it's great that they've started filtering through, like, more to the pop mm-hmm. cultural consciousness now. Yeah. Um, and, well, you know, like, like we I, said we were going to talk about it, and then we didn't, but the, the, the service animal comic that surfaced well, right. a couple weeks ago is evidence of that. Yeah, I mean, that's so funny. <laughs> right yeah it's it's really i think maybe the best like thing to liken it to is kind of like what happened to dilophosaurus after jurassic yeah. Yeah. park right mm-hmm. where it's right. like it's still not a household name exactly like i don't think most people could tell you it that's dilophosaurus mm-hmm. but the idea of a dinosaur with a frill that spits really started like popping up and things after that point like i remember a family guy bit about it where well, like, mm-hmm. Where Chris Griffin thing. has oh, a frill ahead. and spits venom at his mother. Sorry, that was it. I just want to say that it's the same thing that Jurassic World did for Mosasaurus. Is like I'll mm-hmm. tell people I work on Mosasaurus, and they're like, "What?" I'm like, "It's the wet one from Jurassic World." They're like, "Oh yeah, that thing's awesome!" Like, you know. Do, are they ever let down when you tell them that they are literally not the size of, of the no, ship because... that hit the pier in Boston Harbor? No, because or the there's. Harbor, st- they're still ungodly big. Like, I tell them they're not that big, and then I'm like, they're the size of a school bus, and they're like, that's still very big. I'm like, yeah. 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 I, I do just like that this franchise was like, Mosasaurs are how big again? Are they Six thousand by feet? far the largest organism that's ever existed? <laughs> are they yes. a mile long? Yeah, sure they are. Whatever. It's interesting that I think yeah. in the, I think, like, like oversizing them aside, which that this, this franchise does do, um, but I think the Megs in both the Meg one and two are internally within the movie at like within between the two movies and within each movie shot to shot more consistent in size than the Mosasaurus is in Jurassic World. I think so too. Jeez. <laughs> I think the Mosasaurus is as big as it needs to be for the shot. It, to yeah, that's exactly correct. Mm-hmm. But yeah, um, it, it, to your point, James, and then we'll probably kick it to the viewer. Um, is that there are, like, of just how absolutely horrifying these animals are. There's a lot of pieces that Mark Witten has done of, like, basically horror movie inspired. Um, oh, we get to see it again. I think it's this one. Uh, like, depictions of Quetzalcoatlus and other Ashdarkids, where, in particular, there's a lot of shots that he's done where it's, like, a, a juvenile dinosaur in the foreground that's relatively small, and then it's this tree-sized animal that's just looking right at it, and it's horrifying. And man, it, it sticks with me. Oh man, there it goes and break the neck. That's a cool animation. And it looks like yeah, it's a swallow I mean, there, and it goes. Up. I gotta say, I think credit where credits due. I think Mark Witten probably has a maybe is more than any other single person, the person who's made these yeah. go from fairly unknown animals to pop culture touchstones. Like I remember when I was in college shortly before and, and during college, like it, it felt like he and a couple of other people, but mostly he were really just drawing them constantly talking about them, trying to get information on them out. Um, and it's interesting to see the way that like, it really only takes one person disseminating a lot of information, really like generating really cool art and everything to take something from like unknown to pretty popular. Mm -hmm. Right. Like the first movie I saw these in was the walking with dinosaurs movie, which was, you know, terrible, but the, the cats is in there are unnamed as dark. look great. Right. And they're very cool. I think they look great. What's wrong with them? Uh, No, they're, they're barely in it and they're kind of free skins of other things. In the oh, background, I mean, but, uh, well, they're not they're I, not in it a lot, but right. Yes, but uh, what I'll say is like my like cultural touchstone can canon depiction of Quetzalcoatlus was Dinotopia. Oh, the sky <laughs> <dogs>. <laughs> 
<laughs> with the skybacks the like I still, when I think of, like, the scale of Quetzalcoatlus, think of that one James Gurney piece of the guy on the skybacks that's just one of the prettiest oil paintings that's just absolutely stunning. And it does a really good job of showing how big Quetzalcoatlus was. But but even though I will say it's kind of funny, I, I, I actually just the other day was looking through my old Dinotopia books and uh it is kind of funny for to see a piece of media depicting Quetzalcoatlus as these friendly nice like gentle giants <laughs> of the sky when they were like hands down the most evil creatures that have ever took to the wing yeah I here's my hot take I don't think it's unrealistic to depict them thinking they can squabble with T-Rex oh Animals pick fights they can't win a lot. There, I, there, there wasn't a lot of brain in here. There's only 400 pounds and most of it's wing. <laughs> right? Well, these would be... They would have pretty big forebrains. Well, yeah, I mean, right. And they're flying animals. And, and I'm being a little glib, but I don't know. Like, oh, yeah. imagine geese. Like, listen, I could lightly kick a goose and shatter all of its bones I- immediately. It would, it would become the internal equivalent of a shrapnel shell. <laughs> there's a great video of a of a rooster trying to fight a horse and then I've, it's, I've seen that the and horse kicks it's it, kicked right? and it's just <laughs> and it's like oh <laughs> it's <gonna right>. <laughs> I've seen one video like that it's a new like Instagram reel or TikTok I guess format where it's like the horse kicks a chicken it goes off frame and then somebody throws a plucked and prepared chicken into a guy's arm so <laughs> I've seen that one James, I would yeah. I would agree with you. I think, you know, a Quetz might pick a fight with a T-Rex. I just don't think it would win. No, <laughs> oh, no, I don't no. Think, no. I, d- I don't I, think it could spook one away. From, you know, I'm uh, going to maybe, uh, you know, not to not to disparage this great, horrible monster that if I ever saw, I would uh, evacuate certain things uh, and probably die quickly after. But, like... No, I, it's it's not. It's, it's it's not, not it's, it's, a T Rex is turning it into a smear. <laughs> like, be, I, I don't. I don't care how pointy its beak is. Like, I'm, be, I'm right. No, no, no. To be clear, I, I agree. I, the T Rex would win, and I, I don't think a mob of these animals. I, I don't really think that they would effectively repel a T Rex. But I think that there's a tendency we have when we critique like media and documentaries like this sort of stuff to be like, well, that would never happen because this thing clearly couldn't win. Why doesn't this animal know that it would easily beat this other animal? And it's like, it's not an RPG. They don't know their power levels of their armor class or whatever. And nobody had a problem with it when it's Simasukas like doing a little dance at Majungasaurus and Majungasaurus getting confused. <laughs> and what? The, why didn't the Majungasaurus know that if it simply stepped on the Simasukas, it would uh, be able to eat it? Instead, the like the Simasuchus throws it back at the Majungasaurus. In in the defense of that <laughs> section, it's only confused for like two seconds, and then immediately tries to kill it. The Simasuchus <laughs> bought itself like five seconds to get into this, a hole. Th- this is true. This is true. Um, it like yeah, like yeah. If, if if a Quetzalcoatlus were trying to get away from a T Rex, and it turned around and made itself very big, I think the T Rex might be like for a second, like, huh. <laughs> but if there's a, a gigantic mound of delicious treats, I don't think anything is stopping the T-Rex. Well, what I think also would have been the better, or maybe not, I don't want to say objectively better, but a, a, an also good subversive thing for there is build it up like there's going to be a confrontation and then there's not one. Because each of these animals, no, like just like the T-Rex is eating and the Quetzalcoatlus lands takes like two beakfuls of meat because that's all it can fly with. Yeah, The whole okay. animal weighs 500 pounds. Like, how much could it really possibly eat? It's an entire Alamosaurus. It I, weighs I, I like 30 were, tons. I, I thought you were saying the weight of Alamosaurus there for a second. <laughs> I was like, I think you're really undercounting how big Alamosaurus <laughs> is. Pounds. Right. It, it could like go like, wah, wah, and then fly away. And you know, just have it be like it's going to be a big fight. And then it's like, no, they don't need to, and they're not going to. No, that would I, be... Oh, I, sorry, Scott. I, I honestly do think that it would be like a relatively common sight in the southern u.s for i guess that would be tyrannosaurus macraensis we're not going to say that name here <laughs> all right sorry it's Large, currently valid it is, it is currently cur- valid it's currently valid Uh oh um 
Oh, just uh, to be clear to our viewers, because we can leave this in the video, I'm not working on anything about this. It's it just, I, I am interested to see other people test the hypothesis. Um, I'm not really sure what it's going to wind up being, but anyway. Anyways, yeah. so a southern Tyrannosaurus um, feeding on, or a couple of them feeding on an Alamosaurus with just this horrible group of cats just behind, just waiting. Like like you see on the African savanna, where there will be like lions eating a, like a buffalo or something like that. And there'll be like that mob of vultures that are just kind of in the back that the lions don't really pay that much attention to because one, they're probably not going to catch them. Two, there's dead stuff in front of them already. And three, there's not much worth eating on a vulture anyways. Right. Get... Get Darren Nash on the phone, because I just had a very good idea for a segment for Prehistoric Planet Season 3, which isn't as dark as that gorges so much that it literally, like, it is too heavy and is, like, desperate to take (laughs) It's like, I gotta get rid of some of this excess. It's it's just, like, avoiding predators. Maybe the T-Rex even waits for it to eat and is like... It's like it's not it's, flying away. It's seen it before, and it knows it won't be able to fly away, and then just kills it and eats it, and then goes back to eating the Alamosaurus. Well, that actually just reminds me of, like, I I wouldn't be surprised if it would have a similar defense reaction to vultures, where it'll just vomit. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, God, maybe. That's a long way to vomit. Just... <laughs> that's a lot of throat. <laughs> It'd be like the sound it makes in Super Mario Brothers when you get on the flag, like the uh, or like it's those like, two. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the the Shin Godzilla thing, where it's like it's got to charge up for a hot minute. I've never seen Shin Godzilla, but thanks to TikTok, I've seen like you know like my cat at three three a.m. You know, where it's kind of like eyes glaze over. <laughs> um, I think in terms of like. Yeah, in terms of this becoming like a household mm-hmm. name and a household form, like yeah, I think like like you said, Mark Whitten did a lot of, of work to get that going because like it it's been helped by Jurassic World, but this was definitely like getting popularity well before that, and even before like Prehistoric yes. Planet, and it, it would have been popular earlier, I think, and it was right. The thing I want to say is that like all of my dinosaur books from the '90s, like mention it, like everything mentions Quetzalcoatlus mm-hmm. being the biggest pterosaur, but they just it's just kind of thrown in. It's like it's the biggest, and like that's very cool. And then there was that time when everyone was drawing it like an evil pinhead with like, just like a tiny, tiny yes. little so head. Funny. And it, that is kind of bizarre to me because I don't, I, it's, people have done investigations as to like where that started. And I don't, I've read them and I've forgotten them. But like, while we have, we, we still have essentially nothing. I think there's like one or two bones in the skull of Northropi. We have a, a fair bit of the skull of Loss and I. And then there's also the, the rostrum of what became Wellenopterus, which for a while was like lumped in. And frankly, is like is is dissimilar, but it's more similar than the pinhead. Like there were a number of clues to draw it with a more correct head, and I think pretty much as soon as people started doing that, it's like, oh, this is a much more interesting looking animal, right? Mm-hmm. Especially also with the little head. Crust. Yeah, which if you look at the two specimens, or at least the two figured uh, skulls of Q Loss and I in the paper that describes them in the in the. Uh, memoir uh they their crests are pretty different <laughs> the two different specimens like this than this or no from, from each other? other like this one seems to be more kind of this one kind of seems to bridge the two a little bit honestly there's one that has kind of like a very broad and flat crest um that for the like i think seems to be pretty real in terms of its shape i don't think it looks broken and then there's another one that has a much shorter and like pokier tall crest. I don't know if I, I haven't uh, delved into if they discuss what the thoughts of like why they're different. Because I can't I keep being like, oh, you know, it's just preservational, like they just preserved different portions of it. But I keep looking at them and I just can't get my mind around how like they're each preserving parts of the same thing. I'm going to send the images in chat so people can look at it. Um, Cause they each look to be like, they're both broken, but they're not broken in like complementary ways. Hmm. Um, there's that huh. one. And then here is the other one. Do, 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 do. Skimmy, do, do, do. Ba, 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 ba. 
There's some of the surface texture in this guy is Ooh, rough. Ooh, wow. Oy, oy, oy. Yeah, that's pretty different. These are both Northrop I? Those are both Whoa. Lost and I. Lost and I. Like, this um, head is definitely based off of Lost and I, which is a fine thing. Are we are, are we sure they're both That's what I thought when uh, I looked at that. I, I'm, I don't work on pterosaurs, one. but it's not just the crest that seems to be different about these animals. The second one looks a whole lot more like what I've seen Willopterus yeah. described as. Yeah, it's like they are quite different in size too, though. I mean, okay. and it does look to me like they're interpreting most of that crest as broken. Yes, I don't know between the size and the fact that so much of the smaller one does have a broken crest. I, I'd be willing to accept that it's just a, a younger animal. How much difference in size? Uh, it's you like can see uh, the scale bar at the bottom. I think one's almost. I mean, they're not that different. I mean, one's about like a third again larger. That's not different. See, like I could see it as a justification if the rounded one was a baby, because babies tend to have weird little round faces. But like, yeah. <laughs> that's not a baby. That is just another adult that is kind yeah. of smaller. Yeah, yeah but both, I mean, again, only fifty centimeters. Only the top of it is only the top of the crest is real. Like the rest is putty. Yeah, well, I'm not even talking about the crest. Like, the thing that's standing out to me is the beak length, like, objectively is longer on that first one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like, that. Is, that's what I'm saying, oh, is, yeah. like, these look like fundamentally different skull shapes. And, like, granted, while that is kind of, I guess, possible with dimorphism, let's say, or if this was, or if one of them was literally a baby, I don't know about that. I don't know. It, it is also broken interiorly, though. Like, that's not complete. On which one? On the baby, the or the younger one. The, the ventral part of it's complete, it looks like. No, I mean, that margin is pretty clearly broken, like, anteriorly. Like, I'm saying it could continue a lot longer. Yeah. I think if you assume the angle is the same. Dalton, I'm going to give you more work. When you edit this video, why don't you overlay them? Yeah, and yeah. No, I, I will. I will yeah. do that because um, I'm curious to see as well. Because for me, it's really it's like the leading edge of the crest seems mm -hmm. different. Yeah, overlay them in left lateral view like I was made fun of for in the last episode. <laughs> uh, yeah, do that. No, I, you weren't made fun. I was, I was making fun of uh, the internet. And, and the internet. <laughs> True. No, I, I think that what we're seeing is a broken, like, a, that we're basically only seeing the base of the crest in the other one. That That's my read of this without seeing the specimen firsthand. Is, is there oh, anything yeah, else to say? I think I just wrecked this guy. Yeah, this is a good one. The, the, the children will want a meaty one on a big honking boy, so we're giving Honestly, them what yeah, they I'm want. Save this. Yeah. Actually, I'm not going to save this because we've added a bunch of animals that don't belong. Taurosaurus is in there because it's also from the Havilene information, and it's the only other thing that we've looked at so far. But we'll be back. Oh, we love we will Taurosaurus. Be back. When are we returning to the Havilene formation? Uh, remember? Alamosaurus. Alamosaurus. Saurus? I don't remember. <laughs> I fucked it up. <laughs> this is a great design for a horrible animal. Um, the colors are fantastic. Like we said, like the movie design and the game design both are just like... They've got the right energy about them. Like, this is a malevolent creature that you should be nowhere near. <laughs> um, they're very clacky and mean. Yeah, and these co the colors are great um, in the game. They do a good job of showing off the crest and then also having some fun with putting patterns on the wings. Sorry, there's a monster here. Um, I don't, I don't have anything else to say, I mean, other than, like, I like it a lot, and I think it's great, and I'm going to give it an S. It cannot get an H, in my opinion, because this is not a hero, this is a villain. Um, oh, yeah. Correct. <laughs> correct. <laughs> but it is a great design that makes you feel, I think, appropriate things about this animal. Yeah, I think, you know, my usual criterion is, like, how well does it feel like an animal, and how well does it like captured the spirit of the animal um and while i'm like listen there are quibbles we could make with the design like the profile of the beak is not really evidenced in any fossils with that kind of step in it um it's it's italian it's got a bump but it's the bridge of its nose um 
I mean, it's great. It's a fantastic design. I'm going with S tier as well. Like it, it, it is a great. It, it reminds me of the Jurassic Park T Wex. The T Wex. I was the T Wex. Oh, oh, does it remind you of the T Wex? Oh, what do we? What do we remind me of the T Wex? Can somebody fly down here and just put me out of my misery? T Wex had the biggest bite of any dinosaur. It was eight million newtons. Yeah. Um, Scott, please, Scott or Amelia, you're a good shot. You've got the hunting rifle. Just, I don't care how far away you are. Just get it right through the medulla so I don't suffer. Yeah, no like, problem. It just got, it's got to, it's got to shut down the breathing centers of the brain really fast. Um, anyway, um, so please kill me. But it reminds me of the T-Rex, Rex in Jurassic Park. Because, um, what I was trying to say before I humiliated myself on camera was that, there are inaccuracies in the design, but it's a very, very good broad level. This is a T-Rex. It looks like it's supposed to be a T-Rex. It's good for communicating to the public what T-Rex is like. And I don't think it's a problem if the public thinks T-Rex really looked like that. It didn't. It was different, but it's okay. And I would say that this is different than cases like Dilophosaurus mm -hmm. or necessarily Velociraptor, where it's like, it's so different that there's things that need to be said. This is a great design. It captures the evil. It captures the odd elegance and simultaneous jankiness of pterosaurs. Like, I think they're a very odd combination of that. And I love it. Um, S tier. Um, but maybe we give it W tier for James made a fool of himself on camera while he gave it a ranking. <laughs> it's a different system entirely. <laughs> Um, I'm just gonna, right off the bat, this is nothing but S tier. This is one of my favorite depictions of cats in recent media, and I will go even farther and say I prefer this design to the one in Prehistoric King, in Prehistoric Ooh. Planet, even though what? the one what? in Prehistoric what? Planet is an objectively more scientifically grounded design. Um, I think that this thing looks better. Um, although, it doesn't have the honk. No. And it needs to have the honk. It doesn't that is have the, the honk. canonical cat's <laughs> noise. And our canonical beep. But um, I love this so much. I, I echo Amelia of, I would give this H tier if it wouldn't kill everybody I've loved. Um, but yeah, this is the highest S I could possibly give it. It would kill everyone's family, wouldn't it? Yeah. It oh my would. God. Yes. Yeah. It would, and it would enjoy it. <laughs> oh yeah. It's evolved a large enough forebrain to enjoy the act of killing. Well, don't the <laughs> canonic, doesn't one canonically kill a family in prehistoric planet where it's like pecking at the other eggs? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, it does. They are hateful like that. <laughs> um, am I next? You, or, yeah. Yes. No, Scotch. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Um, this is S tier for Serpent God because uh, it's a super serpent. God, I can't do three S's. It's good. I like it. Um, I would echo basically everything everyone else has said. It's pretty. I don't know if I would echo that I like it more than the prehistoric planet design. Um, I kind of like its colors more. Uh, some of these colors are a little more catching than the ones in, in, in the television program. Uh, but yeah, easy S. Uh, also obvious, really any pterosaur with feathers that they make is going to get an S from me. Mm -hmm. So good job. You did it, Frontier. We love it. More. <laughs> Thank you. I, um, I could be willing to give this H for horror. Um, <laughs> but I know, I, I think it's, it's, it doesn't quite fit. Even... Sorry, I feel like I just heard the strangest noise I've ever heard. Um, it was like a was child a revving up. <laughs> a child revving up? It was like someone up? screaming, but they were like revving the scream up. It was also quiet. I'm not gonna... Oh, it might it, it might have been I was watching some no, I'm continuing stuff to hear about it, the think... Jurassic World cats. Hang on, I think it's the raccoons. I'll be right back. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, yes! What? Go see them! Go see them! <laughs> We have raccoons. Uh, there are raccoons in the tree outside of our apartment. Uh, and they woke me up two nights ago, and I saw him descend from the tree. It's a big guy. He's very good. Oh, oh! speaking of waking up, hey, 
Alex, you want to relay what it was like to live to sleep in the same room as me? Oh, <laughs> oh I heard. <laughs> Remember, well, how did he I, slept, how did I he slept it? in a bed with me the next night. Yes. Oh, yes. just, oh, yeah. The, the, the way I, at 3 a.m., my eyes would snap <laughs> open, uh, like like one of those close-up shots in SpongeBob, where it's all super detailed and gross, <laughs> and I could just, like, the second I woke up, I imagined my eyes looking like that. I, I did not see them, but it's definitely the raccoons. They're making some wild noises. Um Anyway, where was it? this Dalton in a panic? I think it's the raccoons. Run I want to see them. They're, They're cute. So I, was so no, good. I know. So I just cute. I thought it was like you were in some perpetual battle with them. Oh, I wish. I just want. I just like to see them. No, so yeah, not H. It, it, even though I have a broader feeling on that, I don't think H has to be like small and friend. This is not suitable for H because it's just too mean and scary. But. uh this is definitely S tier. There are, like we mentioned, a couple of quibbles you can make. Um, I'm more lenient with the shape of the bill because I could imagine that being like a keratin. Um, I think the neck seems a little bit too short, like not egregiously, but a bit. And it, it may be that like, this kind of throat pouch is throwing me off a little bit too. Um, and then the other, but, but really that's it. Like the only other problems that I have with it are like the posture it takes when it's on the ground is not quite what we think they would have like look like the, the some of the behavioral things but it's all stuff that like i just is water under the bridge for me because like i said it's it just seems to be symptomatic of putting this on the, the rig of the other pterosaurs when it it really probably would have been better suited with a different model but i understand why they would do that because it, it seems like the the pterosaurs like their kind of retinue of behavior as they're supposed to be in an aviary is kind of more limited so yeah you know uh say love you uh i like it it's nest here Say la vie. Perfect. That's S's across the board then. So, unanimous S tier places it right on top Whoa. here. It's S for sinister. Yes. S it is indeed S for sinister. That's a very sinister critter. Yeah. Sure is. All right. And let's see if next week's critter will be just as sinister. <laughs> When we spin, spin. Yeah, that wheel's getting spin. smaller. Thank God. That, that, that wheel. 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 Oh, we a Will we continue streaks? <laughs> it likes streaks. It really likes streaks. Oh, oh, it, oh. wow. No. Oh, well, my God. Man. We foreshadowed it in the last uh, one. All right. Uh, yeah, I mean, yay. Yay. <laughs> Wahoo. <laughs> Wahoo. Carithosaurus. 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 Right. I like Carithas. Snorris. Suck. <laughs> No, All right. I actually, Got I think him. this is a cool dinosaur. I it's like really, Carithosaurus. Yeah. I'm actually uh, spoiler for next week. I'm not going to be able to be at the recording, <laughs> and that makes me sad because I like Carithosaurus. Um, well, he, Carithosaurus loves you too. Yeah. Well, you know, and listen, it's not like it's not for a good reason. Uh, we have we have a, a, a very important exhibit to open at the museum I work at, so I will be busy with other things. Yeah. yeah. James, you can say what it is. It'll be after the opening. Oh, well, I mean, it's also been publicly announced. Yeah, we're opening the Dueling Dinosaurs exhibit. For those who haven't figured it out yet, I'm a postdoc involved with that project. So this is really cool. It's exciting. So before we go, uh, we just want to take this opportunity to thank all of the really generous patrons uh, who make running this channel and continuing to do what we do possible. Um, so we'll have credits running right now on screen. All of our patrons' names uh, at the time of editing will be in the credits. And I briefly want to thank, by name, all of our uh, most generous patrons who support us at Gorgosaurus tier and higher. Um, as of this recording right now, these include Benjamin Seepser, nickname, uh, original username, Philip Fico, AK92, Christopher Bellis Jones, Adam Molos, Ben Brocklehurst, Dan O'Kyrus, Dinodom, King Zashu, Max Ironpaw, Pythonic, Wanderer, and we. So thank you all very much for your support of the Skeleton Crew. Uh, remember that uh, if you like our videos and you want to see more of them, please let us know in the comments. Uh, tell us if you enjoyed anything about our video. If you didn't enjoy anything about the video, please leave some weird comment. Um, Ooh, kitty cat. You know, for instance, okay. imagine you're at a con telling a group of people that they're like the Big Bang Theory of paleontologists, <laughs> and then imagine <laughs> the most out-of-pocket thing you could possibly say yeah, after you, that. You can't. Okay, so if you like our videos and you want to see more like them, please leave a comment, like the video, and tell us what you think about Quetzalcoatlus and what you're excited to see us talk about with Carithosaurus. Um, 
Thank you to all of our viewers. We're very tired now <laughs> and are probably going to record a very short video now after this. So we're going to wrap this up. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs>